Good evening. I call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for August 11th, 2020. At this time, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. This evening's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on the BCPS website, bcps.org, and on BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding motions, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. May I have a motion to go into closed session as permitted by the Open Meetings Act, as found in the Annotated Code of Maryland, General Provisions Article 3-305B1 and B7, to one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personal matter that affects one or more specific individuals. And seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. May I have a motion? So move, Lisa Mack. Is there a second? Second, Lily Rowe. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Thank you. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunta? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. Good evening. This is Kathleen Causey, Chair of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. I now call to order our regularly scheduled meeting for August 11th, 2020. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence in recognition of all of those who have ser served Baltimore County Public Schools. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In accordance with the mandated direction of the state superintendent, Baltimore County Public Schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's resolution approved at the March 10, 2020 board meeting, this board meeting is going to be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members, subject to the establishment of the mechanism that allows each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present. And that allows the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Open Meetings Act. As a result, tonight's board meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through live stream on our BCPS website at bcps.org. It is also on BCPS TV, carried on Comcast Xfinity Channel 73 and Verizon Fios Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion. 
as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. If we could have everyone mute their microphones when it is Thank you. The first item on the agenda is consideration of the August 11th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Good evening, Ms. Causey. I'm not aware of any additions or changes to tonight's agenda. Thank you. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, over, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. And seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item on the agenda is personnel matter matters and for that we call on Ms. Lowry. Good evening Chairwoman Causey, Superintendent Williams and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters. Termination, retirements, resignations, leaves, recognition of deceased, and Northeast Area Advisory Council appointment. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D6? So moved, Max. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Mahamza. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Patcher? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. The next Thank item you. on the agenda is item E, new business administrative appointments. And for that, we call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, board and Madam Chair. I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. Uh, seven assistant principals at the following schools, Cromwell Valley Elementary, Dundalk High School, Franklin Middle School, Hebville Elementary School, Millbrook Elementary School, Watershed Public Charter School, which is a 0.6 position, and Woodmore Elementary School, a principal at Parks Elementary School, specialist for literacy pre-K to 12 in the Office of English Language Arts and Pupil Personnel Worker, Office of School Climate, Pupil per Personnel Services and Responsive Student Programming. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved. Back. Do I have a second? Have a second? Second. second row. Thank you. Is there any discussion, board members? I did just want to uh, take a moment to appreciate Dr. Williams and staff. There were um, uh, input from stakeholders regarding Sparks Elementary School, and I'm very pleased with the um, process, and I'm pleased with how they uh, incorporated the input from the community in their decision. 
So I wanted to thank you for that. Any other board members? Yeah, I um, also wanted to uh, congratulate our new uh, assistant principal at Dunlop High School. Uh, as a senior there, I'm very happy to see her, see her come on board and can't wait to work with her. Thank you. May I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kim? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Mr. Offerman? Mr. Mahanza? Mr. Mahanza? Yes. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Thank you. The motion carries. Dr. Williams, if you'd like to announce your appointments. Sure, thank you. Our first candidate is Samantha Yuhanik, assistant principal at Cromwell Valley Elementary School. Uh, she brings 16.6 .6 years of experience in Baltimore County. Uh, currently, she's a teacher resource at, in the Department of Staff Relations and Employee Performance Management. She serves as a teacher previously at Halstead Academy, Riverview Elementary, Reisterstown Elementary, and Pinewood Elementary. Congratulations, Ms. Yuhanik. Our second candidate is Catherine Albert, assistant principal at Dundalk High School. Uh, she brings 14 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she's the teacher resource at Newtown High School. Previously, she served as a dance teacher in Newtown High School, Windsor Mill Middle School, Windsor Mill Middle, Lock Raven Academy, and Southwest Academy. Congratulations, Ms. Albert. Next, we have Samuel Buckley. He is new to Baltimore County Public Schools, so welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools as the assistant principal at Franklin Middle School. Uh, currently, he is the assistant principal at Bel Air Edison School in Baltimore City Public Schools. Uh, he's also was the assistant principal at Westminster High School in Carroll County Public Schools. He served as a teacher, physical education, health, and athletic director at uh, Mergen Thier, Thyler Vocational High School, I apologize, as well as KASA Kesa High School in Baltimore City. So welcome to Baltimore County Public Schools. The next one is Caitlin Shinton, Assistant Principal at Hebville Elementary School. She brings eight years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she is the teacher resource in the Office of English Language Arts and served as a classroom teacher at Dundalk Elementary School. Congratulations, Ms. Shinton. The next candidate is Leslie Stepney, assistant principal at Mill Brook Elementary School. Uh, she is bringing one year of service to Baltimore County. Uh, she was currently at Winfield Elementary School. And prior to this, she served Baltimore City Public Schools for over 20 years. So welcome, welcome uh, and congratulations to Ms. Stepney. The next candidate is Dr. Elizabeth Fair, assistant principal, point six at Watershed Public Charter School. She brings to us 20 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she was the resource teacher at Riverview Elementary School. She served as an English teacher at Parkville Middle um, a classroom teacher, Pandonia International Elementary School. She was a consulting teacher in the Office of Organizational Development, as well as a classroom teacher in Sparks Elementary and service of approximately two years in the Los Angeles Unified Dip School District. Congratulations, Dr. Fair. Our next candidate is Ashley Swantek assistant principal at Woodmore Elementary School. 
She is new to Baltimore County Public Schools, so welcome aboard. Currently, she is serving as the principal intern math facilitator in Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, uh, Huntingtown Farms Elementary School. She also served as a math facilitator grades two to five in Mecklen Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools. She was a classroom teacher for three years and a classroom teacher in Alexandria City Public Schools at Cora Kelly Elementary School. Congratulations, Ms. Swante, and welcome aboard. For our principal, we are recommending Ms. Megan Shaiko Lee, the principal of Sparks Elementary School. She brings to us 20 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she was the assistant principal at Mays Chapel Elementary School. She served as a, a special ed teacher at Battle Grove Elementary and a hearing impaired teacher at Villa Cresta Elementary School. Congratulations. Next, we have Jean Filbert, specialist, literacy pre-K to 12 in the Office of English Language Arts. She brings to us 10 years of service in Baltimore County. Currently, she was the teacher resource in the Office of English Language Arts in Deep Creek Middle. She served as a supervisor of English Language Arts in the Office of English Language Arts, uh, pre-K to 12 elementary. She served as a language arts specialist, as well as a reading teacher at Pikesville Middle School and English teacher at Lock Raven Technical Academy. Congratulations. And I believe our last candidate is Greg Palmer, a pupil personnel worker in the Office of School Climate. He brings to us 19 years of service in Baltimore County, where he served as an instrumental music teacher at Deep Creek and Sandalwood Elementary School, as well as Middle River Middle. Congratulations, Mr. Palmer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams, and welcome aboard. The next item on the agenda is public comment. Because the board is meeting virtually for today's meeting, only written public comments can be accepted. Comments may be emailed to boe at bcps.org which will be distributed to the Board of Education members. Public comments requested to be uh, attached, or excuse me, to be published publicly and received before 11.59 p.m. the day before the board meeting are attached in board docs under this agenda item on the day of the board meeting. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Dr. Williams. Sure, thank you. So good evening again. I'll start tonight by celebrating our staff with some summer updates. We know that schools serve many roles and our Office of Food and Nutrition Services has been providing grab and go meals since this crisis began in March. To date, we have distributed more than 1,820,000 meals for students. For summer learning, our traditional summer programs were provided virtually to targeted students during July. In addition, Summer Learning Height is being offered online through August 28th to provide opportunities for students to practice math and reading, as well as live tutoring from our BCPS teachers. We'll provide another report uh, to the board in September regarding our summer programming. As part of the continuity of learning plan and reopening plan, every school created a re-engagement plan in July to address specific school community needs and goals. School plans focus on re-engaging students in several ways throughout August, including small group academic virtual intervention, social emotional support activities and orientation activities for transition grade students and new students. We continue to build the capacity of our teachers and administrators through summer professional development, including weekly professional learning for new administrators. Teachers may choose optional workshops about virtual teaching and learning during the weeks of August 17th and 24th and mandatory sessions will be provided during the teacher pre-service week of August 31st. 
Topics will include best practices in online lesson development and delivery, how to improve the functionality of Schoology and Google Meet, and how to meet the social and emotional needs of students in an online environment. Thank you so much to our schools and central offices for supporting our students and staff. I also would like to recognize our continued work and conversation on race and racism. I appreciate the openness of our school leaders as we continue our equity work. A few weeks ago, on July 24th, Milford Mill Academy principal, Kiria Joseph, led a system-wide conversation on race and racism with assistant principals. Ms. Joseph asked critical questions and assistant principals shared their insights, including obstacles that they faced when becoming one of few black administrators. Our work continues always with a focus on providing the leadership that our students need and deserve. Congratulations are in order for Officer Daniel Moore, the school resource officer at Overly High School. Officer Moore was named the 2020 Floyd Ledbetter National SRO of the Year by the National Association of School Resource Officers. During Officer Moore's short tenure at Overly, she has mentored countless students and served as a transformational leader during and outside the school. Thank you so much, Officer Moore. As we approach the new school year in four short weeks, I'm proud that all principal vacancies have been filled with the one exception of one late retirement. Other positions throughout the system have also been filled during this pandemic. And I really would like to credit the hard work of all of our staff, specifically the staff in the Division of Human Resources. And finally, I look forward to providing updates this evening about our reopening plan, school sports and school scheduling. Thank you, and this concludes my report. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The next item on the agenda is the chair report. While this is typically a more relaxed time of the year, the current state of emergency due to the COVID pandemic has prevented any break in the incredible work that is being done in Baltimore County Public Schools. As you have heard from Dr. Williams, there's very impressive work and supports that are going on right now and will continue up until the start of school. Impressive supports for our students, for our staff, for our families, all in an effort to support our community in this crisis. Previously at the special meeting of the board on Tuesday, June 21st, the Board of Education voted to approve Dr. Williams' request to engage the students in virtual instruction for the upcoming school year, 2021, beginning September 8th, 2020, through the end of the first semester on January 29th, 2021. The board also approved adding to the reopening plan to indicate that BCPS will add an additional survey for all stakeholders following each academic quarter of virtual instruction in order to use feedback to promote continuous improvement and also to include guidance in the plan around school and extracurricular activities in a virtual environment to include resources for student leaders, volunteer organizations and school administrators. At that meeting, the draft reopening plan was discussed extensively, including the school systems, uh, the boards and the school systems dedication to the well roundedness of our students to their social emotional health and to encouraging physical activity. Uh, as we worked through all of that conversation, the board is the what the overarching program of education policies and etc. And the superintendent and his team are the how the implementation. And we appreciate all the work of Dr. Williams and his team from then until now to complete the reentry plan, which will be made public this week. We appreciate all of the input of our stakeholders. It was all forwarded to Dr. Williams and his team and submitted to the uh, design team for the reentry plan. I wanted to take a moment and appreciate my colleagues on the Board of Education. While this is normally a relaxed time, it is it is not relaxed. 
because we are very focused on providing the best that we can for each child in Baltimore County Public Schools. On the board, we have seven parents of current Baltimore County Public School students. We have three retired educators that have over 30 years experience each. So when we are making these decisions and having these discussions, we are personally and professionally vested in doing what's best. As Dr. Williams said, the work continues around equity and that is work that will continue throughout the year. I also was pleased to attend the ceremony to celebrate Officer Danielle Moore as the National Association of School Resource Officers, Officers of the Year. This is quite a distinguished accomplishment considering that there are over 14,000 school resource officers nationwide. Her positive impact at Overly High School highlights the enormous value of the SRO program in Baltimore County Public Schools. She is highly valued by her principal and the Overly Scholars for her empathy, discipline, and diplomacy. SRO Moore is non-judgmental and supportive in her multiple mentoring roles to the students. So we, I was really happy to be there and to celebrate her work. Um, I also wanted to take this time to say that as we all prepare for the coming school year, let's all really take a deep breath and really commit to being positive about all we can do for our students in this time. There's a quote from Galatians, so let us not become tired of doing good, for if we do not give up, the time will come when we will reap the harvest. And the harvest will be our children doing the best that they can in this uh, very untenable situation. But as we are, we were discussing the updates to the reopening plan, we were getting excited, other board members, and you'll hear in the discussion later, we're really looking forward to the updates from Dr. Williams, that this is a time to be creative and innovative. So I'm looking forward to the updates and that completes my report. The next item on the agenda is a student member of the board report Mr. Mahamza. Hello. Um, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair, Superintendent Williams, members of the board, and Team BCPS. It is my honor to give my second report on the important work that the student member has been doing these, pa these past few months. My work, like many other student leaders, did not cease following the emergency closure. We continued to meet uh, to team uh, build and stay connected with uh, and stay connected with all our our endeavors. Early on, the school system created a social social and emotional learning committee tasked uh, with keeping our students engaged during this tumultuous period. The group met uh, countless times where we discussed initiatives like mental health flyers, Instagram live Q and A sessions. Uh, and other activities geared to support the mental health of our students. It was my pleasure serving on this committee and other committees that were initiated by our superintendent and his staff to include the voice of, of our stakeholders, especially our youth. Other notable committees uh, included, sorry, uh, where is it? Other notable committees uh, included the Student Handbook uh, work group, which was led by Dr. Zurchin, who, have, who I have had the chance to work with on other uh, climate-related issues. The school, uh, the school uh, reopening group work group was also led by, uh, was led by Dr. Adams, and that was focused on um, getting students' perspective on the reopening plan. And the Mind, Mind Over Matters work group, uh, which was led by the climate, uh, the school climate department uh, was tasked with uh, planning for the Mind Over Matters uh, month. I was also honored to be the guest speaker at Dundalk Middle School's commencement ceremony, uh, Ridge, Ridgely Middle School's avid uh, celebration, and the Grange uh, Elementary School uh, summer, summer celebration. Next, I want to uh, acknowledge a very important group of people that, I've had, that I have had the pleasure of working with. This, uh, this was the uh, planning committee for the BCPS race and racism conversation that occurred last month. Mike, uh, Michael Dickerson was gracious enough to ask me to be involved in this monumentous uh, project, project that he and our superintendent had incepted. We began, uh, we began as a small group, which included Dr. Dick, uh, Mr. Dickerson, 
Dr. Lisa Williams, Dr. William Burke, Mr. Jim Corns, uh, Mr. Brandon Orland, Miss Alyssa Alston, and the communications, uh, the communication, uh, sorry, Mr. Eric Dodson, and it pretty soon grew rapidly to include other members of the communication uh, team, other central staff officials, and uh, school uh, school system leaders. Dr. Williams and uh, Dr. Um, and Mr. Dickerson, I commend you both for your steadfast leadership and commitment in ensuring that our school system is one is, is on the just uh, trajectory for equity for all our students. Furthermore, in order to fulfill my commitment for equity for all our students, I have. I have been arduously researching, talking with families, and meeting with uh, school officials to better understand the plights of our special needs students, who are a demographic of students whose voices are not heard as much. Two weeks ago, I met with our new director of special education, Ms. Perendozi, who is recent, who just recently moved to Baltimore County from Florida, and was uh, nice enough to allot some of her precious time to. Uh, describe the program to me and explain in depth some of the issues that ha that they have been seeing that families have been facing especially during this uh this COVID age i will personally continue to uh, keep myself informed on the on these issues and advocate for our special education students family of special uh, for the families of special ed students you're welcome to email me with any further concerns or keep me updated with new information uh, information concerning IEP. Uh, special thanks to our school officials for being transparent and uh, accepting my request for this meeting. Uh, earlier today, I also attended a meeting with our county government leaders who were having an important discussion concerning equity as it relates to policing. Uh, special thanks to our county executive, John Yeo, for forming this committee and uh, extending an invite to me. The, mem the other members of this committee committee included uh, community representative Crystal Francis, uh, Tony Faget, the Baltimore County uh, NAACP uh, representative, Councilman Julian Jones, uh, Colonel Robert McConnell, McConnell from uh, Baltimore County Police Department, Anthony Russell, uh, president of Blue Guardians, Scott Schellenberg, state's attorney, John Skinner, professor of criminal justice at Towson University, Senator Charles Sidner, David Rose, the Fraternal Order of Policing, uh, Chief Melissa Hyatt, Baltimore County Police Department, uh, Drew, Drew Vetter, uh, Baltimore County Department, uh, Deputy Administrative Officer, uh, Darrell Brooks, Office of Law, James Dills, Office of, Public Defend of the Public Defender, Kelly Fenner, Baltimore County Police Department, Rick Hyatt, Baltimore County Sheriff's Department uh, and our very own uh, County Executive Johnny O and Troy Williams from the law office. Uh, you can watch these meetings on the county government's live stream and today's meeting was uh, streamed on the WBFF Facebook page. In closing, I want to, I want to thank uh, my colleagues for your hard work on this board, our amazing superintendent who has shown uh, tremendous leadership in our school system and our, hard, our hardworking educators and staff who, uh, whose work really uh, gets the acknowledgement that, they, it's a des that is deserved. We all have an aw uh, awesome responsibility uh, to affect meaningful changes to better, our li to better the lives of our students. And it is going to require all of us. I look forward to working uh, proactively with this board as we do this great work. Please feel free to email me with any concerns and also reach out to me on all social media platforms. And yes, to the adults, that also includes Facebook. I know it, it is rare these days for a youth to have an account. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Mahamza. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business consideration of board policies. Members of the board, the Policy Review Committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's recommendation to amend the following board policies. These have been previously discussed and moved forward to first reader, and now we're asking for approval at second reader. Policy 0100, Equity. Policy 1230, Area Education Advisory Councils. Policy 3410, 
Responsibilities and Duties, renamed to Transportation Services. Policy 3420, Routes and Services, renamed to Transportation Services, Routes and Bus Stops. And Policy 4101, Drug-Free Workplace. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as Exhibit J. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendations of the Board's Policy Review Committee? So moved, Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Ms. Hester? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunta? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rouse? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, the motion carries. The next item on the agenda is item K, unfinished business deadline for filing financial disclosure statements. And I'm going to ask Mr. Nussbaum uh, to present the information Yes, good, good evening. <clears throat> the, um, the board in the spring, well, let me back up, I'm sorry. The, the board policy and state law requires that financial disclosure statements be filed on or before April 30th of each year to cover the following uh, year. However, because schools were closed uh, starting in, in March, the board agreed it by way of motions and, and uh, resolution in the spring uh, to um, to extend, excuse me, I'm sorry, to extend that deadline until 60 days from the date that school uh, reopens. Uh, in light of the fact that school is now reopening in a sense in the, in the way of a, of a virtual uh, classroom, I thought that the, the, uh, it, it made sense for the board to um, determine a specific date on which the financial disclosure statements are due. So there's a resolution uh, for consideration by the board that would set that date. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Would you like me to read the resolution now? Yes, if you would like to make a motion and read the resolution. Okay. I move that the board accept the following resolution entitled Deadline for Filing Disclosure Statements 2019. Whereas Board of Education Policy 8364, Section 3, requires that financial disclosure statements be filed annually on or before April 30th of each year to cover the calendar year immediately preceding the year of the filing. And whereas the Board of Education on April 14th, 2020, voted to extend the deadline for filing financial disclosure statements from April 30th to 60 days from the date schools and offices are reopened for staff, and whereas on May 19th, 2020, the board passed a resolution extending the deadline for filing financial disclosure statements by new hires and appointees for a period of 60 days past the date when the school system reopens after the current emergency closure. And whereas schools are scheduled to reopen for students, albeit in a virtual capacity on September 8th, 2020, therefore be it resolved that the deadline for filing financial disclosure statements for 2019 pursuant to policy 8364 is hereby extended for a period of 60 days past September 8th, 2020, and that all persons who are required to file such statements shall do so on or before November 9th, 2020. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Is there a second to her motion? Offerman, second. Not second. I'm sorry, Ms. Scott, second. Okay. Board members, is there any discussion? Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Dickson? Yes. Ms. Pastor? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahunta? Yes. Ms. Causey? 
Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Newsbaum. The next item on the agenda is unfinished business. Baltimore County Public Schools reopening plan for fall 2020. We asked Dr. Williams to introduce the reports on the following items, update on the reopening plan, update on school sports for school year 2020-2021, school scheduling. Following each presentation, will allow time for discussion if the board so desires. Uh, so this evening, I have um, Mr. Billy Burke, who will be able to provide additional information as well as uh, members, uh, the chairs, uh, or the facilitators of the design team. And so just a reminder to the board, this is a follow-up to the July 21st, 2020 board meeting. At that time, the board approved opening school virtually for the first semester for the 2021 school year. As the board is aware, each school system's opening plan is due to Maryland State Department of Education no later than Friday, August 14th, 2020. During the July meeting, in addition to approving a virtual learning platform for the first semester, the board directed staff to include two amendments in the school system draft reopening plan. Those amendments have been incorporated into the plan and we appreciate the board's input and feedback. As you will recall, our reopening plan includes input from many stakeholder groups, including students, parents, teachers, principal staff, and union partners. As previously mentioned, this plan is due to MSDE by Friday, August 14th. And once we receive input and feedback from MSDE, we will make sure that the board members and all of our stakeholders are aware of any changes mandated by MSDE. The start of the school year is less than a month away on September 8th, 2020. We look forward to providing this information to our families and to virtually welcoming our students and staff back to what we are working hard to make a productive and successful school year. For this evening's meeting, I have asked staff uh, present and to present some of the highlights of the updated plan which uh, will be posted on our website site later on this week. So with that, I want to turn it over to Mr. Burke. Thank you, Dr. Williams, uh, Mrs. Causey and members of the board. Uh, Mr. Corns, can you move to the next slide, please? Mr. Burke, can you hang on for one second so we can get uh, the PowerPoint aligned? Certainly. Thank you for your uh, uh, patience, Mr. Burke. You're ready to go. Thank you, Mr. Corns. Again, uh, as Dr. Williams stated, I will be providing uh, some brief updates and highlights from the reopening plan, and then there will be an opportunity to ask questions, and I'm honored to be able to provide this update to you. Um, this slide is simple in its structure. Uh, BCPS will operate in a virtual model until January 29th, 2021. And with that being stated, um, just a reminder that it was included in the new plan that we will revisit that decision at the end of the quarter uh, to see if um, conditions have changed and we are able to go into the hybrid model earlier. Uh, just a reminder, 
that health and safety are the first priority in the decision making uh, for the decisions that are included within the reopening plan. Our second priority is really about rigorous instruction. So students will have access to rigorous standards-based instruction and instruction will vary and include teacher-led instruction with the whole class, independent work time, small group instruction that could include remediation, acceleration, and enrichment. A significant request from stakeholders was that daily schedules would run on a consistent bell schedule. You will see in some of our documents, we refer to that as a virtual meeting schedule. Uh, those two phrases are interchangeable. And so in that way, school in this new uh, uh, reopening plan will look more like traditional school. And then finally on this slide, um, the conditions for returning to face-to-face -to -face, uh, will be evaluated quarterly. I'd like to provide some additional comments not listed on this slide around areas that were really important to stakeholder groups. The first is around attendance. BCPS teachers will take attendance using the BCPS student information system. We refer to that as SIS or SIS. BCPS has outlined attendance procedures during virtual instruction that are in alignment with MSDEV MSDE's COVID-19 guidance requirements. In these procedures, attendance is defined as presence and will be recorded for official reporting purposes and for the identification of additional student supports. Elementary teachers will take daily attendance and middle and high school teachers will continue to take period attendance at the secondary level. In terms of grading, teachers will be expected to adhere to traditional grading and reporting procedures as outlined in the BCPS grading and reporting procedures manual. We will use traditional grades, A, B, C, etc., and not the purely pass or fail option that was instituted during the emergency closure. In terms of assessments, BCPS is creating diagnostic tasks in each grade level, content area, and course in order to diagnose unfinished learning during the spring 2020 continuity of learning. These diagnostic assessments will provide teachers with information on students' mastery of critical content and prerequisite skills. The diagnostic tasks will be administered early in the school year during the first marking period. Teachers will then be able to use students' present performance levels along with the adjusted curricular scope and sequences to develop instruction and learning pathways tailored to students' needs. In addition to the diagnostic tasks, teachers will continue to administer the BCPS end of unit curriculum based periodic assessments in order to monitor student progress. And then one final comment before I open it up to questions. Um, there's been some concern about internet and Wi-Fi access. So BCPS is using recent COVID relief grant funds to provide hotspots to families that need internet access. If a family needs access, they should make that request to their school administration. In addition to hotspot access, we are also working with Baltimore County government on small rural broadband grants to expand wireless services to the parking lots of key schools in our rural areas. Um, and with that, uh, we can uh, we can open it, open it up to additional questions about the reopening plan. Thank you, board members. Um, since I know that uh, all, this is a very important issue to board members, I'm just going to go around the dais to give everyone an opportunity. Um, it, we can start with uh, Dr. Hager. Um, thank you so much, and thanks for the information that we've received about the reopening plan thus far. Um, I have a, a few specific questions. One is about um, high school start time. 
Uh, this is something that's come up a few times um, because there we, we aren't restricted by sports and bell schedules or I'm sorry, uh, sports and bus schedules. So uh, do you have an idea of what time high schools will start each day? Uh, thank you for the question, Dr. Hager. Um, Dr. Roberts will be addressing schedules uh, in another slide coming forward, but I can give you a brief comment. Um, secondary schools will operate between the hours of eight and three and schools as they determine their schedules will be able to pick their start and end times based on the coursework provided. But again, Dr. Roberts will provide greater detail around that as he does his uh, slide presentation. Okay, sorry, sorry for jumping ahead. No, um, it's, it's, there's a lot. <laughs> I know, it's so much. Um, and so um, one concern I have, I know you mentioned hotspots for students. Um, I'm also concerned about teacher Wi-Fi stability. Um, I know there are a few times last spring where the teacher themselves were, they were unable to attend the class meeting because their own, you know, technology issues and Wi-Fi issues. Um, so will uh, kind of teacher attendance be monitored, but also assuming their attendance is limited by their technology capabilities. Is that something you guys have been discussing? Yes, we have been exploring what options we could provide to teachers uh, to ensure that they have internet access. It does include hotspots. It may include providing actual locations uh, where they would have better access, uh, but we are still investigating those opportunities. I've heard of um, learning centers and other things in other counties uh, similar to that. So that that's that's great. Um, and will um, will there be any flexibility in your plan? So I noticed um, you know there's a lot of logging on and logging off uh, throughout the day. Um, is this something that's that's set in stone, or will it be continually revisited? Uh, I believe we will continually revisit the entire plan. Could you speak to me more about the um, logging on, logging off issue? Um, the, uh, I was looking specifically at uh, kind of the, the, I know it's not set in stone yet and it's a draft plan, but the kindergarten day where it's a lot of small group activities and break out and break it in and things like that. And with little kids, you know, I just, I worry a little bit about kind of the logging off and logging on throughout the day. Sure, and, and I think we, we share the con same concerns the one thing we want to be uh, consistent or thoughtful around, though, is continual screen time. Uh, so making sure that kids just aren't sitting in front of a, a, a screen hearing a teacher teach, but have opportunities to turn off the screen, go in to do independent work or work in small group. Again, age appropriateness will matter um, and how we direct students to come in and out of those opportunities, especially at the kindergarten level, are absolutely being discussed. Um, my remaining questions are really about sports and schedule, so I will end there. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Uh, Mr. Burke, uh, I do have a, a follow-on question uh, to Dr. Hager. Um, she was talking about teacher support and specifically Wi-Fi uh, and uh, access, but I wanted to take it a step further and ask what other supports are being provided to teachers so that they can successfully uh, provide remote instruction um, you know, to their classes? Sure. What else are, are we gonna give them? Certainly um, there are uh, professional development opportunities to improve the capacity of teachers and administrators when working in the online environment. Uh, Dr. Williams mentioned in his remarks, uh, some opportunities that are available the week of August 17th and 21st, as well as the pre-service week when teachers are back. Um, and then there will be PD available uh, during the actual um, semester, uh, and that'll be available weekly, whether it's school-driven or system-driven. So that, that, um, that professional learning opportunities, there are about 10 modules in development right now. Again, as Dr. Williams mentioned, they have to do with uh, improving online uh, design and delivery of instruction, uh, social and emotional uh, supports for students online, uh, as well as how to use the technology in a better way that uh, better meets students' needs. In addition to those professional learning supports, content offices, um, every central office that provides uh, support to schools will still be available uh, on a consultative basis in order to lean in and uh, give advice, 
provide support, uh, work through problems. Uh, those will be the primary ways. Uh, and then finally, uh, schools, principals, and then teachers directly are supported by the executive directors of schools and the community superintendents. Uh, that support will not stop. Um, and there have been frequent check-ins during the summer with administrators. Uh, I know that those check-ins will continue to move forward as uh, we go into the actual school year. Thank you for that. Um, besides the focus on professional development, and that sounds pretty key and very important, are there specific items that teachers are being outfitted with to allow them to efficiently provide instruction remotely, for instance, a small whiteboard that they could simply write on. Um, I, I guess my, my point is, I don't expect our teachers to have to go and, and purchase these things themselves. And I would think that it would be pretty standard practice to have certain things um, in hand when you're trying to run a remote classroom. A great question again. Um, thank you for that, Mr. Kuhn. Um, so teachers will have the opportunity to go into their classrooms for a day in order to identify the materials that they would like to take uh, back in order to provide high quality instruction. Um, part of the COVID relief grants actually allow us to buy some additional technologies that may be supportive as well, uh, including um, better grade document cameras. The cameras they use now are on their laptops and sort of limit the ability to move around during demonstration teaching. Uh, and so some of those technological upgrades uh, would be available, but teachers will have access to the materials in their classrooms and decide which ones uh, they would need in order to improve. That could include uh, chart paper, uh, white small portable whiteboards, uh, markers, things that would support instruction. We are, um, we don't have a specific list of them to pick from because we want teachers to have the professionalism and autonomy to decide from the materials within their classrooms, which ones would best support their instruction. Thank you. You're welcome. And as I look at, um, you know, this, this slide that you just provided us, the, um, the conditions for returning to face-to-face, -to -face, um, <clears throat> you know, we're gonna definitely take direction, right, from the, um, the health department and from the state as conditions change. Um, and I'm not trying to put you on, a, on the spot, but have, do, are there definitive guidelines uh, that everybody is aware of that if we check these boxes then we're ready to go back in person. I know so there, there are different phases. I'm just curious as to, do we have that outline and provided somewhere for people to see? Sure, I, I appreciate the not wanting to put me on the spot, but it's almost impossible in this uh, setting. Uh, so I appreciate the comment. Um, there are two guidance documents that the design team used. One was provided by MSDE and Dr. Salmon. The other was provided by uh, Governor Hogan. Those are the, the main guidance documents, but Governor Hogan and Dr. Salmon have also provided autonomy to each school district um, based on the conditions uh, in their areas. So uh, an actual checklist um, isn't really possible based on that autonomy. Beyond that checklist though, the, the phases are well described and defined in the guidance documents from the governor and from MSDE. Okay, Mr. Kuhn, if you're done, we are, um move on to Ms. Pastor. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Burke, first of all, to you and to the staff, thank you so very, very much for the work that you have put into this and for being very clear that what we're about to begin is real school. 
this is um, not in any way, shape, or form reflective of what was done during the spring. So thank you for all of the work. Really, really appreciate it. Um, I, I want to start, though, uh, with the hot spots and those children who don't have Wi-Fi access. Um, I heard you say that you would try to make sure that there are hot spots on the lots uh, at schools, et cetera. But certainly because now they are engaged in real classroom work and they are going to be uh, in need from two to three hours, 3.5 hours, which is a lot of time to be on a parking lot if necessary. And my thinking tells me that there's a good chance if they don't have the Wi-Fi, they also are not in living circumstances where someone can sit with them for that long period of time so that they can sit in a car while they're being educated. So having said that, I know that um, staff knows that as well. Um, and so I just wanted to put that out there just so you'd be able to say, oh, absolutely, Ms. Pasteur, we are certainly working on that and we're working with our um, county partners and other folks to make that happen. So I'm gonna stop for a minute so you can go ahead and say that. Yes, Ms. Pasteur, you are absolutely right. If I, if I misspoke or wasn't clear before, I apologize. The hotspots are being sent directly to students' homes. Uh, or they will be able to, or they will be able to pick them up. Um, the, the, what I was referring to in terms of the parking lot was a work, some work with the Baltimore County government for our most rural areas, where even a hot spot doesn't work because cell phone service is so poor. And so, the um, in in every opportunity we can provide a hot spot directly to a student. That's what we're attempting to do. Outstanding, outstanding. Thank you, because we do get a number of questions around that. So thank you so much um, for addressing that. Um, also, I'm, and, and this may come a little later, but I'm, I'm real pleased as I hear from um, administrators of uh, the kind of flexibility, and will somebody speak to that? Because I think it's important for people to hear that. What kind of flexibility um, administrators were offered? Um, probably that'll come up with scheduling so um, that our young people are getting a, a real education and it's gonna be driven by their particular school. So not all schools are gonna look exactly correct. Is, is, is that so, Mr. That Burke? is That is correct, Mrs. Pasteur. And I believe Dr. Roberts will address uh, those concerns when he speaks. Okay, then I'll, I'll just wait now and, and hear the rest. But again, thank you so very much um, for what you have said thus far and the work done. Thank you. Mr. Offerman? Yes, uh, my question is about the entire uh, taking of, uh, uh, entire taking of, of attendance. Uh, am I correct, or are you correct that we'll be doing that for, for, uh, for each class, is that correct? Mr. Offerman, that is correct at the secondary level. Uh, elementary schools will take it once in the morning as class begins and then add to that as if students enter the class later within the day but at secondary at the secondary level we will be taking attendance at each course and each period okay uh well i have one additional thing if, if, if a student uh is present online but then uh somehow uh his uh his involvement is stopped you know during in the middle of the class is, is, is he going to be considered present or absent i believe the default will be uh present but those are conditions that we're still working through some of the details around that we know that there will be times when it, at no fault of their own a child will you know be dropped out of the 
out of the internet. And so we're trying to figure out the best way to accommodate when those things happen. Uh, those are still details that we're working on. But if you've attended, we're gonna default to present um, and then work from there as we uh, identify additional situations that need to be addressed. Thank you. You're I'm welcome. Fine. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Um, my question is going to dovetail with uh, Mr. Offerman's question about attendance. I was just wondering um, if students, uh, what number one, I just want to clarify. So attendance would be marked for uh, attending the virtual meeting. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, okay. And so if students, um, have an emergency or can't make it to class or um, their parents are working or something like that. Um, is that an ex excusable absence? I'd have to get back to you on that, Mr. Mahomes. I don't know uh, to that level of detail I could speak correctly. I, yeah. I could add to my comments, though, um, although attending the virtual piece is important and you'll be marked uh, in your attendance for that too because students will be required to work asynchronously or offline as well there will be a way to monitor um, and take attendance for the work that was expected to be done during those asynchronous times and that will be part of the attendance as well okay that's why i thought um and also, uh, some parents were wondering um, if they wanted to uh, view the cl uh, virtual class like on demand, are they going to be reco recorded? Like, let's say a student is unable to attend that class that day, are those classes going to be recorded? So there has been a lot of controversy around whether or not uh, lessons can be recorded. Some of that has to do with student privacy. Um, I, I believe, as of this point, our stance in support of the a teachers union is that teachers will have the option to record their lessons, certainly following any of the uh, security issues that come up when students have opted out of that. They'll have to make sure that those students are off camera and that the things are turned off so that they're not captured within those recordings. But uh, it's not mandatory that we will record, but teachers will be given the option to record those lessons. I'm hopeful that they will, because then they could bank them as resources uh, for students later. OK. Um, thank you. That's it. And Ms. Joes? Ms. Joes, did you have questions or comments? No, I didn't. So. Okay, Mr. McMillian? No, I didn't ask anything. I'm just going around the dais for questions or comments. Ms. Mack? Um, yes, I have a few questions. Um, Mr. Burke, first of all, thank you. thanks to you and the team for putting this together. Um, I noticed in the schedule um, we have asynchronous work, with, and I understand about that, but how are our students who can't read going to do independent work, like our kindergartners who, you know, haven't mastered reading yet or our kids who are below grade level? Is that up to the teacher to decide what the student is going to be doing during that time? Is Are we going to send out things for the teachers to give, you know, to suggest to the parents that the students use the time to do this type of thing? Uh, Mrs. Mack, thank you for that question. I know that's a concern many are having. Uh, and yes, the answer is both. Um, we will provide uh, curriculums like we always have to kindergarten teachers that identify within the scope and sequence of the curriculum appropriate grade uh, and age appropriate independent work that can be done if you're a non-reader. And so that will still exist. And then teachers will have autonomy based on their experience to design those independent work activities as well. Uh, I, I know it might seem implausible that a five-year-old can do independent work without reading, but I, I assure you they can. Um, and 
Our curriculum is designed with those kinds of activities uh, embedded uh, so that teachers will have options. Uh, and then again, they'll also be able to use their expertise. And to that point, will teachers have real-time contact information for with wh whoever it is the child is with that day? Um, because, you know, I know kids are much more technologically um, savvy now than they were, but w when they get off and they come back on, if they have problems and the teacher notices that, you know, a student's not on, will the teacher be able to contact the parent or the caregiver and or is there somebody who could walk that person through getting the child back into the, the classroom environment? Sure. Um, I'd like to uh, give a little more information to the first question now that I've had a chance to process and then, and then speak to the question that you just asked. Our paraeducators are uh, finally going to be outfitted with devices so that when students need to work uh, independently, they would be available to provide some of the support uh, while the classroom teacher uh, is working on other options. So that I, for I meant to mention that as we were talking about how students might work independently and what supports would be available. I have to get back to you on whether teachers would be able to contact parents. Uh, certainly, um, that would be difficult uh, in, an, in an immediate situation, depending on the number of students you were working with and the kind of supports and, and uh, activity you were running and designing. So I'd hate to say yes or no. I think it's something that we need to explore and then come back with an answer around. Uh, I'm not confident I could give you uh, a, a really well thought out answer on that. Okay, I appreciate that. And one of you just kind of hit on my next question. Um, will all like speech language pathologists, nurses, occupational therapists, and any other non-teacher related provider have devices? Yes, we are working div for devices for all those teachers, uh, all the teacher, um, of n n teachers that are not teachers of record, which are the service providers and the paraeducators. That's our intention is to provide devices to all those teachers. And then um, you mentioned, or I think Dr. Williams mentioned that I know that all teachers come back the week before school starts, but it sounds like there's going to be an opportunity for two additional weeks, or is it one more additional week of professional development? Yes, ma'am, it's two additional weeks, and those are optional weeks. Um, we're using grant funding, the COVID relief grant funding, the CARES Act. Uh, the tutoring grant has uh, some provisions in it. We are using those to provide uh, those, those extra opportunities for teachers. And teachers will be paid for that if they yes. choose to attend? Yes, ma'am. And one of the things that I'm hearing is, and I, somebody hit on it earlier, it might have been Mr. Kuhn, but teachers are asking um, like down and dirty tricks for the best way to use presentation technology to you know, seamlessly go from thing to thing. Is that something that could be included in one of those professional development activities? Yes, ma'am, it absolutely is. We have uh, some of our uh, resource teachers from Mr. Korn's office um, and from the content offices who have really developed some expertise and skill in navigating those uh, softwares um, and are designing uh, professional developments for teachers to sort of give them the tricks of the trade in how to navigate using Schoology and Google Teams uh, and some of the other uh, technological applications as well, but right now really concentrating on the delivery um, applications through Google Teams and Schoology. And I have one more quick question. When teachers go in to get their supplies, will they be able to bring back, bring home Elmo, their Elmos? I don't know if I've seen a specific list of things that we are allowing them to leave with, uh, and that is in discussion. I do know we we believe that they should take what they need and that they'll sign off on what they've taken so that we have an inventory of that and can monitor and make sure that we get it back when when it's time to return to face to face uh, we're not we haven't finalized all those decisions but i think it's it's very likely that that would be available to them uh, when they go in to get their materials thank you very much uh, mr burke thanks for all your work on this and thanks for answering my questions absolutely Ms. Scott? Oh, yeah, thank you. 
Um, my question is, <clears throat> I was looking in here and I didn't see it. Is there anything in there that talks about, I guess, sort of dress code or code of conduct? Has a student handbook for the school been updated or anything for um, a virtual dress code or code of conduct? Uh, thank you for that question, Ms. Scott. Uh, Dr. Zarchin's office and Dr. Nieves are working on guidance around how to maintain uh, the appropriateness of the environment uh, in this virtual setting. I don't know if specifically there is information about uh, dress code, uh, so I would have to get back to you, but I, I would believe that guidance will be ready for release uh, soon. And um, uh, But I know that there are discussions and plans around that based on stakeholder input. Um, I just don't have that information exactly for you right now. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Bro. Yes, I have several questions. Go so ahead, my, first, my first question is, there has been a number of concerns that have been brought to my attention that there doesn't seem to be a plan where it concerns the fact that we have situations now where in a traditional classroom, students and the teacher and school staff are the only ones that are in the classroom. But with students on virtual learning in their homes, anyone in that home may be overhearing or um, potentially have exposure to our students. And I would like to know, what are we doing as far as the safety of our students, um, where it pertains to educating teachers and students, or particularly teachers, I guess, how to make sure that students don't accidentally steer off into conversations that might reveal personally identifying information of each other to people who may be in the homes of other students. So, um, because you can't do background checks on other people in other homes. And, you know, so potentially if there's 25 kids in this virtual class, every single person whether they even live in the home or not, who are in the other homes with the student on virtual learning could potentially be there listening. And what I was thinking is that it might be beneficial to encourage the use of headphones. Um, thank you for the statement uh, and question, uh, Ms. Rowe. Certainly the guidance that uh, Dr. Zarchin and Dr. Nieves are providing uh, around the environment will address some of the concerns that you just uh, that you just brought up. Um, we can absolutely take back the suggestion around headphones and how we might make those available uh, for students to ensure a, a different level of privacy. Uh, those details are all still being worked out, and I do appreciate the comment. Uh, we can absolutely take that under consideration. Uh, and again, I would look to the guidance that Dr. Zarchin and Dr. Nieves are going to provide in order uh, around the safety of the environment. Uh, and to update my last comment, one of the great things about working virtually is that your friends can text you while you're giving your answers. And so um, in, the, in the guidance that they're providing, there is guidance on dress code, as Ms. Scott asked. Uh, so I'm glad I was able to clarify that. But uh, again, Ms. Rowe, thank you for the comment. We will certainly take that under consideration. And as Dr. Nieves and Dr. Zarchin uh, create that guidance that document, document, we will make sure that uh, those considerations are in included. Okay. Um, my next question is, are there going to be, in the schools that we're going to set up hotspots and parking lots, because that's the only option, are there going to be SROs sitting in those parking lots in their vehicles in order to ensure the safety of students? And is there going to be some kind of like hours so that people who have no other option but to use those parking lots know that there's an SRO there? Because sitting in a parking lot in your car is not necessarily something that is considered the safest thing in the world to do. And, you know, it's something as a woman 
safety courses have advised me not to do. So I'm just wondering about the SRO presence. Yeah, uh, I would have to um, get back to you on that information. I don't know uh, right now whether that's part of the plan. You know, the idea so, that when I- So Mr. Burke, let me just chime in. As we were talking, this is Dr. Wiggins, as we were talking about looking at these hot spots, uh, we will definitely will have to look at a safety plan and work with our partners to ensure that. I think we can just simply just take that back to the design team once, once we are ready to look at that option. So thank you for that feedback, Ms. Rowe. Okay, um, my other question is, I was told in the spring by some of our homeschooling families that are overseen by BCPS staff that the homeschooling families were held to the same standards um, that the school system would have normally held them to, even though the standards for the rest of our student population were far more relaxed. And I wanted to know, coming in the fall, are the homeschooling families and our school system going to be held to the same standards as each other? Or I guess what I'm looking for is if our school system relaxes standards or has mitigation for COVID-19 situations, are those being extended the same courtesies to our homeschooling families that the school system oversees? I would have to talk to the head of the homeschooling office uh, to get a real clarified answer for you. I will tell you though, um, that is, um, those standards are set by uh, state regulations, not by BCPS. Uh, in terms of their ability to monitor and, and change decisions based on COVID, um, that I, I think lies within the autonomy of the family. In terms of what they must complete, again, that's, uh, that's uh, created and monitored by the system, but um, the decisions around that are, they, they come from state guidance documents. Uh, Dr. Um, Boswell McComas, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that uh, conversation. Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Burke, and this is Dr. McComas this evening. Good evening. Um, Dr. Burke, uh, Mr. Burke really identified that we follow tightly what the guidelines are set forward by MSDE, and as Mr. Burke said, we will um, work to, um, with the um, head of our home and hospital, I'm scared, sorry, our homeschooling office uh, to pull together a summary and I will work with Dr. Williams to determine what is the best way to help inform all of you of what's involved with that process um, and how that was handled in the spring and if there's any appropriate adjustments that would be made in the fall. Okay, um, I only have two more questions so bear with me. What is being done for special education students who, by virtue of their disability, cannot learn in a digital environment um, and who can't really do anything unless they're with a special educator? I'm going to ask Dr. Boswell McComas to jump back in for that question as well. Yes, hi, um, Ms. Rowe. Um, again, great question. Thank you for that because I know that there's many uh, families with students with special needs that are um, looking forward to how this fall will go. And so what is really important, and I, Ms. Rowe, I know you understand this um, just because you're such an advocate for our students with disabilities, that every individual education plan really needs to be worked out thoroughly uh, between us as a service provider um, with our families and our teachers and our students. And so for individual cases that are um, more severe, that's really something that we need to come to the table um, as part of our annual IEP um, evaluation and review process. And we will be doing that uh, this fall with each family in the normal annual review process. And so your, your question is a very compelling one. And um, each of those cases are so uh, nuanced that they have to be discussed and supported individually. So if a student's IEP review isn't until February, does that mean that they don't attend school until February? So Ms. Rowe, the IEP that would have been in place uh, previously is still in effect. And as uh, you know, in the spring, we um, worked with families to create amendments. But at any time, we can schedule um, a IEP team meeting to come um, together 
to assess what needs to happen um, for the best interest of the student. So that would not have to wait until February. At any time, a team to support IEP can be um, called. Okay, so do the parents just have to request that if they feel that needs aren't being met? Yes, as is always the case, they should stay in close communication with their um, special education team and their school administration team to help support that process. Okay, um, my last question is, we've had a significant number of emails about block schedules, and I'm aware that Kenwood High School, the school is making the decision um, about which way they want to go on that. Is that something that all of our high schools have the option to do? And if they decide to go with a block schedule and we go back to school in January, will the entire school year be block schedule or will they go back to eight periods in January? So, so this is Dr. Williams, uh, Ms. Ms. Rowe, that, that presentation is upcoming from, Ms. from Dr. Roberts. Um, and so I would just ask that you hold and maybe we will answer your question when we get to that slide. Okay, thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Um, I wanted to um, ask a few questions and some of them are dovetailing with some earlier questions. Um, so I'll just go in order. So um, I appreciate the conversation around um, developmentally appropriate screen time for our children because that has been a concern uh, that has been raised by uh, many parents and even um, students in uh, this spring continuity of learning. Um, also relative to rural broadband and mentioning that um, for those areas where the Wi-Fi hotspots will not work, um, that rural broadband will be expanded in some high schools or some um, buildings parking lots. I just wanted to point out that what that actually means is that our students and families that may in fact live very, very far from the nearest school or library will then be the ones that have I believe it was Ms. Rowe pointed out the safety feature uh, factor in sitting in a parking lot of a school that has uh, very few people in it. Um, you know, in terms of being in a building, and Ms. Pasteur had sent questions along those lines. Um, are PAL centers uh, having space inside the libraries, or even um, some other districts are having very limited access in some schools? So is there gonna be continued evaluation because this really is, is, um, it, it is really limiting for those students and families? Yeah, Ms. Causey, the answer to your question is absolutely yes. I know that uh, Mr. Corns and his team are constantly looking at options that um, might make the process work better for any student that is experiencing uh, a problem with access to internet. So yes, absolutely, we are explore. We will continue to explore options. Okay, thank you. And the other issue with attendance that was touched on by a number of board members. Typically, when um, school was in session and children are attending, if your child didn't attend the first period, you would get a call home and said your child was not there today. Um, what are the possibilities for parents? Um, to review their child's attendance um, and, and to understand that they are getting to their classes um, as they are scheduled to. I, I would like again to get back to you with a, 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 with a really detailed answer on that, Mrs. Causey, um, but because attendance will be taken in a traditional way, um, parents would be able to monitor attendance in the same way they would have been able to monitor attendance before. In Schoology? Yes, ma'am. Okay, that will, that will be helpful. 
Um, and to dovetail with Lisa Mack's question about uh, students logging on and, and potentially having problems, I know that we have um, a, a method, a help desk, if you will, for parents to register um, technical problems. But is there something that could be considered along a help desk now? Like I've gotten kicked out of my class and I'm trying to get back. Um, that would be a more urgent um, path where students could get helped at, in that moment in order to, again, take advantage of the instruction that passed. We can certainly uh, look at that, uh, that opportunity. I do believe that the, the, the existing help desk would be the main function for providing that support. Uh, but again, uh, we're all listening to your comments. I, I'm sure we will discuss uh, if there are additional options that can be considered. Okay, thank you. And then um, one question that I haven't heard, and and if it was in the revised plan, I apologize, but there was a lot of discussion about um, a process during this first semester of virtual instruction where teachers may request permission to teach or complete other work from their classrooms on a scheduled or an as-needed basis, um, and that there may be a process where those requests could be uh, considered by school administrators or um, the central office. Um, this has been uh, communicated just recently, I mean, even recently, um, around CTE, our career technology, where there's very specific equipment related to um, our students' coursework, um, also our sciences, where um, typically uh, a teacher would have access to lab equipment to do experiments and so forth. So um, has that been given more uh, consideration and is there is that in the updated plan or is that something that's still being worked on? It is not in the updated plan, Mrs. Causey, but we are absolutely continuing that discussion. I think um, it's important to understand that a broad decision around that would be problematic because of the inability to safely handle the mitigation, but on an as needed uh, basis is something that we are absolutely considering and trying to figure out how we might best serve uh, teachers that need the, the ability to, to reach the equipments that you described or have um, special situations that need consideration. We are in the middle of those conversations right now. Uh, so it is absolutely ongoing. Okay, thank you. And um, Ms. Hen was unable to be here this evening, but I know um, this would be a question. Um, there was uh, the conversation about extracurricular activities um, and supporting that. So is there more information in the uh, re-entry plan or is that something that the schools will be um, connecting directly with their school community to talk about how to virtually support um, all of those activities that help our children, one, find joy, something special that they really, really, um, that really speaks to them, but also uh, a lot of these other ones, robotics, coding, environmental club, um, that can really help the well-roundedness of our children. Again, I appreciate the, the question, Mrs. Causey. It is mentioned in the reopening plan. Our expectation is that schools work to make those extracurricular opportunities available when appropriate and possible based on the conditions that we're operating under. Some you know, will be easy to manage and some will be quite difficult. And so schools will have to have some autonomy around what's possible based on the conditions. But it is mentioned in the plan that our expectation is those opportunities remain viable. Thank you. And as the board looks um, overarching at the um, major pivot that's being done, one of the um, issues that is being shown is uh, prioritizing the budget and reallocating, realigning the budget in, um, there are areas where we will not be spending as much money um, because we will not have students in the building. Um, and then there are, of course, other avenues where we will be spending more money, as you mentioned, additional equipment for the teachers, um, and possibly providing things for students. Um, but uh, when would the board and this may be for Dr. Williams, um, receive information about that realignment of the budget and how um, that, that's affecting the school system. 
thank you, Ms. Causey, for that question. I can't give you a date at this time, but that's the work that we're doing to look at what we're spending, how we're spending, and any potential increase during the school year. Um, this has been a rocky road at the beginning based on a maintenance of effort budget. So I cannot give you a date. I think we have to look at this for the whole year. And at the end of this year, um, probably as we're recommending a budget, we may be able to give you some updates around that time. Thank you. Okay. And uh, finally, the um, last question I have relates to our unions. We know that they have had the opportunity to provide input into the reentry plan. Um, and I, we also understand that there's development of a memo of understanding um, in order to realign some of the um, our human talent and our resources that we have available um, into um, different avenues than, than typical. So I wondered where was the um, school system, your administration in reaching those uh, agreements? Again, it's not directly identified within the reopening plan, but I know that Mrs. Lowry uh, and her staff are working uh, constantly to uh, update those MOUs with the uh, bargaining units. I believe they've made great, uh, great strides in completing those. I know they're not quite finished, but are close. Uh, and um, and hopefully they will be finished soon. Uh, but we know that they need to be in place in order to effectively move the system into opening so that uh, teachers and other staff members that belong to those units have a clear understanding of the expectations. Okay, thank you very much for that. Board members, are there any other uh, questions or comments before we move on to the next item? Yes, um, I wanted to take it back to um, Ms. Rowe's comment about, uh, I, th I believe it was her first comment about um, student privacy. Um, Mr. Burke, I would think that what she was talking about um, is already prohibited in a normal school setting. Am I correct? Yes, you are. Okay, so it would just be the matter of the teacher telling the student this is inappropriate. Um, basically, that's it. Not really much goes into that. I, would, I, I get her point that, like, if a, a parent or another adult uh, from another student's house is, like, actively watching students, but I don't think it's a huge concern when it relates to, like, private information being shared because it's already prohibited in a school setting. That's all my comment. Thank you. Ms. Collins, may I have one other question? Yes, Ms. Farrell. Um, so what is the status of SAT and other standardized test administration? I want to pull that up for you. So uh, right now, Mrs. Rowe, BCPS has investigated the possibility of offering a fall SAT day in our regular administrations of the PSAT. But because school is 100% virtual and buildings are not open to groups of students in order to promote the health, welfare, and safety of students and staff, the fall administration of SAT day and the PSAT will be canceled through November 13th, 2020, which is the end of the marking period one. During this time, BCPS high schools will not host Saturday administrations of the SAT while buildings remain closed to the public. But please know that we are monitoring health conditions and we will make adjustments to these decisions as conditions warrant. Uh, the Office of College and Career Readiness and Assessment are investigating how BCPS can support students who wish to participate in private administrations of these assessments when possible. And I just want to repeat, please know that we are actively monitoring when conditions may change so that we can make this opportunity available. Uh, but right now, uh, it's just not possible. Um, okay, thank you. May I ask another question, Dr. Burke? Uh, go ahead, Mr. Mahamza. Yeah, so um, for the students who already have signed up, um, for the test one in August and I believe it's September. Uh, can you please talk about uh, what the next steps could be for them? 
Um, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Adams if he could weigh in, if he has an answer. If he doesn't have an answer, we may just need to get back to you, uh, Mr. Mahumza, but I, I, uh, let's see if Dr. Adams has an answer. Yeah. Hi, hi good evening, uh, Mr. Mahumza. Good evening, um, Dr. Williams, um, Chair Kazi, and board members. Uh, thank you for the question. The offices of assessment and college and career readiness are exploring um, what we're seeing around the state um, currently in other school systems is that they're also beginning to cancel their Saturday administration. So I know a few other of our surrounding and larger school systems have canceled their August administration. And um, we are in conversations with college board about where they might be able to, because this is also a college board challenge. So we're in conversation with them about where they may be able to offer the, um, where, where they may be able to offer the SAT, given that um, school, it appears we have a trend now where school systems that are operating virtually and not allowing students and large numbers of students and staff to be in the buildings are not allowing the SAT to occur in their buildings based on the health conditions of the pandemic um, currently. So we're in conversations with college board. And as soon as we um, know what those options are, those offices of assessment and college and career readiness will be prepared to work with the communications office and communicate that to schools and families. Okay, so like seeing the August test is near. So let me just, I'm sorry, let me just interject for these specific questions. Uh, we will work with our principals to look at what alternative that we can provide with uh, the specific questions around assessment. So I, for the principals who are watching at this point, this plan is fluid. This is what we are knowing at this point. We're not going to just put it on the shelf and not look at this plan. Um, these questions specific around the school, this is, this is why we have our principals leading our schools. They will definitely provide us feedback. They will be involved in terms of what about the seniors? What about kids taking assessments? What about the staff having access to materials? I just want to remind the board that at this point, our principals will be doing what they've done masterfully as well as our staff masterfully during the closure. They've been very creative. They've been very innovative. They've been trying to address every specific need. And we have been very receptive to take on their questions. So I don't want to go so far into all of the specifics at this point, and mind you, I understand these are burning questions for board members, but I just want to just emphasize, I don't wanna to go too far in the details of the plan without working with our leaders of the schools to really help us navigate. Um, and I do wanna uh, remind the board, we, we really have two more slides to review, which is the big request around sports, we want to give an update and then several board members had questions about scheduling and we want to get to that i think uh several of you asked you've heard probably from several parents so i really want to try not to get into so much of the weeds at this point with the fact that you have asked me to come back and provide updates as we start with the opening to provide updates quarterly and so i just want to be mindful of these questions and, and really putting Mr. Burke and Dr. Adams on the spot. I, I just want to overemphasize, we are starting school September 8th and we are going to work with our school leadership to try to provide the best uh, situations for our students and staff during this pandemic. And so, um, Ms. Causey, I, I really would like for us to talk about the staff to really give an update on athletics since I know that was a burning issue as well as the school scheduling. And this won't be the last time that we will have conversations about our opening plan. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And I do just want to say that, um, you know, we, we definitely concur with the school leadership. I know even in regular times, there are principals that have had conditions in their building, either overcrowding or um, lack of air conditioning where they have gone out and secured facilities in order for their students to take the SAT and other uh, AP tests and so forth. So um, I agree with you that th those are details that certainly we know are urgent for our students and families and that you'll be working with the school leadership 
um, as they come up with their solutions for, uh, for their communities. Um, so at this time, we will move on to the update on school sports for the school year 2020-2021. So good evening, uh, Mr. Corns, could you? Thank you. So good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Williams, Chair Causey, and members of the board, I'm here this evening to share with you um, how we have worked to reimagine athletics for the 2021 school year. You know, we are as a community in a really unique time right now, and it's important to all of us that um, as we move into the start of the school year that we approximate normal and that we work to create what is a temporary normal until we can all return to uh, life before a pandemic. Um, and and it's important that our parents and community members naturally want to understand how is it that athletics will happen this fall and this spring. Um, we're in August and normally athletics would be beginning in just a few days and everyone wants reassurance that we're working hard not just to keep our children safe from infection uh, but to make sure that they have greater athletic access, um, excuse me, access and supports uh, this fall and um, in the spring as well. And I'm happy to share with you this evening um, what we are uh, doing and how we have reimagined this opportunity for our young people. Um, and so many of you are quite aware that um, early last week, the uh, Maryland um, Public Secondary School Athletic Association, often referred to as MPSSAA, uh, made an announcement to postpone uh, fall and winter um, athletics. Um, and so our um, concept graph that you have before you today really reflects um, our alignment with that announcement. Um, and what we are looking at is providing in the fall, if you take the entire school year and you break it in half, we're looking at providing in the fall the opportunity to uh, for students and coaches to engage in virtual coaching um, and conditioning um, so that we are able to do several things. We're able to uh, maintain community with our athletes. We're able to help um, them learn how to uh, engage in lifelong um, athletics and, and personal fitness. Um, as a form of conditioning. Um, and then we will take the second half of the year um, and align it to three mini competitive seasons. Now, um, this, the dates that you have on the screen before you for each um, projected season in the, in the spring um, are subject to change. We are anticipating that MPSSAA will make future announcements. We are expecting one in early September. Um, and certainly any announcements that come from um, MPSSAA, we will certainly work and flex our plan to be in alignment with. So those dates may shift a little bit, but right now um, what we have before you is some anticipated or projected dates of um, seasons that could be held in the spring. So I want to take a little bit more time um, to talk to you about um, what students would be experiencing in the fall virtual um, portion of athletics. Um, what we envision there is that too will be broken down into uh, segments that align with seasons and that our coaches and students would be able to have daily team practice in a virtual format. And the structure of those um, that week um, of coaching would follow the the following pattern. So Monday's coaches would meet with their teams virtually. They would engage in goal setting uh, with athletes and help them map out what are some of the daily things they need to do as an athlete um, to help with their individual conditioning. I actually have to tell you, I think this is an exciting opportunity to help our students really learn some lifelong skills um, in a way that I think will serve them well as, as they get into adulthood. Um, Wednesdays will be skill specific days and then Fridays will also uh, work on skill specific uh, drills and workouts along with a reflection for the week. Tuesdays and Thursday team meetings will really focus on social emotional aspects of, of team building to ensure that our students are able to maintain and continue to uh, benefit from the community that we get from being on teams. All of us, myself included as a former athlete, you know, our teams will help us create a sense of community, um, help us develop a sense of goal setting, help us develop a sense of um, accomplishment and identity. Um, and so our efforts around the fall virtual coaching phase will be structured in that manner. 
classroom. I will say as we move into the um, spring competitive season, safety of course will be our first priority um, and we will certainly make accommodations um, that are appropriate and in keeping with health and safety guidelines at that point. Uh, we certainly will finalize our competitive um, seasons um, in alignment with any announcements from MPS SAA um, and we are hopeful that our students will have um, um, a productive um, and engaging spring semester as well. Uh, there's just one last final thing I'd like to say uh, for all of our coaches who may be listening. We are in the process of working out the details of those EDAs uh, to ensure that um, our, our coaches are um, appropriately supported in this process as well. And so on that, I'm happy to uh, address any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dr. McComas. Uh, board members, we will go around the dais and um, if board members could uh, just quickly ask their question knowing that other board members will probably ask um, some additional ones as well. So we'll again start uh, with Dr. Haker. Thank you. Um, I really wanna thank you for this plan. I think it's um, just very well conceptualized as a parent of an athlete, this is uh, gonna make her day. So thank you for giving them hope that there may be something in the spring and also incorporating this um, this face-to-face -face with the coach. I think it's just such a wonderful idea. I just wanted to confirm this is for current athletes, but also potential athletes, those who are looking to try out for sports. So this is kind of, it, it could, could involve a large group of children, but it, it is for anyone who wants to try out. Is that correct? Yes, thank you, Jeff. Haker for giving me the opportunity to clarify that. Um, it is. That we, we are open. The eligibility is open. So you can be someone who wants to go out for a team for the very first time and participate. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. That, that's all. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kuhn. Oh, thank you for providing this. I do have a question about the seasons. I know that this is, you know, your first attempt to show us this information. But I see the third season goes through June 18th and our seniors are usually, um, have graduated and are no longer in school uh, at that point in time in a, in a normal world. And I know we're not in a normal world. <laughs> so um, with that being the case, what or how would we approach that? We, would we offer them to to continue to play or would we perhaps change the timing of this i'm just curious right thank you for your question i think it's um really a poignant one um and so first i would like to say uh, or just um, reiterate that you know the timing of these are projections right now and that we are looking forward to hearing any announcements from mpss aa so that we would be in alignment with what other systems are doing and what um, may be the landscape for the state so that all athletes uh, to include our seniors were um on a level playing field, if you would. Um, on that, I would um, invite um, Mr. Sai, who is with us this evening, if he has any further detail. Um, um, Mr. Sai is our coordinator for athletics, and so he may be able to provide you a more robust answer in terms of thoughts around seniors in that final season. Yes, um, so that's a great question. We have had those um, conversations with the MPSSA and seniors will be allowed to continue their sports season once they uh, graduate, or if they graduate prior to the sports season. Thank you, Mr. Sai. Thanks for sharing that, Mr. Sai. I guess the other point that I would make or question that I have kind of hand in hand is that we have um, a number of outstanding athletes and there's expectation that they continue to play as they move on into college. So I know that this is new for everybody and it's extremely challenging. What plans do you have in place to support the recruiting process and the ability for these athletes to be seen and known um, by uh, college coaches so that they can transition to college uh, as an athlete successfully? 
Right. So again, I'd like to invite Mr. Sai uh, to, to share any discussion that he's participated in, perhaps with MPSSAA. So um, what we plan on doing, especially in the virtual phase, the first semester, when we talk about the engagement of the coaches, um, that will be one part of it. We talked about uh, social emotional, we talk about the providing academic support, we talked about conditioning, but assisting those kids in terms of next steps going on to college, whether it's playing or just getting them into school. I mean, that's the coach's responsibility and we will continue to encourage that. That will be a part of their responsibilities uh, moving forward, not just in the first semester with the virtual, but once we come fa back face to face in terms of assisting those kids. Uh, those kids look at those coaches as mentors and, and role models and trying to get them to move on to the next level and they will continue to do that uh, throughout these very difficult times. Yeah. And then I have one final question. Um, I know that our buildings are all closed across the system, but fields are not um, inaccessible, I guess is the way that I would put it. If we have athletes that are trying to work out in a virtually condition, is the expectation that they are not to use our facilities, meaning tracks and fields and such as that, um, or what? what is the expectation? Right, I think if, if our students, because I do know um, that some of our facilities are gated and um, the community may not have access and there may be other areas uh, that that community members can access and certainly our students um, are members of that community. I think it would be important to know that um, as students are working through their self workouts and they need a, a place that work out that um, any kind of social distancing and safety guidelines that of course we need to exercise at all times in all environments would be adhered to and so that would be part of our work. Um, the coaches coaching students on where where are safe places? Where are you working out? If you're working out in, in some location in the community, that you're being mindful of the social distancing and the, all of the health guidelines. I'm not sure if, uh, Mr. Sai, you have anything else that you'd like to add to that. But No, uh, so through looking through an equity and safety lens, uh, we will be um, talking to our coaches about providing conditioning programs that are body weight based um, so that all kids have the same opportunity to work out, whether they can get to a track or, or some type of facility because all kids don't have it. So with that being said, we're going to promote um, a, a particular program to make sure that all kids have the opportunity. Again, also encouraging for those same students because we know how kids are, they're gonna to wanna to work out with their friends and continue to encourage to, to, uh, to uh, use the CDC guidelines and BCPS guidelines uh, as they come together to work out. Because what we don't wanna happen is to see an uptick in cases because we're not following the guidelines and they can't get the, um, the competitive season out of the way. Thank you for your answers. I appreciate it. I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Ms. Pasture? No questions. Thank you both. Mr. Offerman? No, uh, nothing. Thank you. Mr. Mahamza? I have no questions questions. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. McComas, Mr. Sai, and Dr. Burke for the presentation. Um, I think Mr. Kuhn asked some of my questions, so thank you. It's a lot. Mr. McMillian? Thank you. However, I have no questions. Mr. McMillian. <laughs> okay. Um, Ms. Mack? Thank you, I have no questions either. Ms. Scott? Thank you, that's a really very good presentation. Um, my only question is, is um, for students coming in who may want to enroll in sports, is it the same process, just going online, filling out, I guess, presumably the form or saying which sport you'd like to be in, and is, is it pretty much the same process? It will be the exact same process. It will be the same process. Nothing will change in terms of registering, uh, the paperwork, all that stuff will be the same. And that will start in the virtual coaching phase. So that just so that we can make sure the kids are safe and that we have the paperwork saying that the parents approve of 
them, you know, participating in this program. Um, so nothing will change on that aspect. Okay, and all that's accessible online for students? Yes, uh, we'll still be using Form Relief to do our uh, online um, registration. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? I know less than nothing about sports, so I'm just going to listen to this part. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Rowe. Okay, thank you. So that, that leaves me, and um, I just wanted to um, thank Dr. Williams and, and Dr. McComas um, and the rest of the staff that's worked uh, very diligently in trying to um, come up with this athletics reimagined for our students. Um, I want to thank Mr. Sai um, personally um, because I know how dedicated he is to the children to not only succeeding, as Mr. Kuhn said, into elevating to the next um, level, whether it's NCAA, uh, Division One, Two, II, or Three, or just continuing on with the sports, but for every child to have that opportunity to be engaged. So I personally want to thank you because I've witnessed it for years. And in this very difficult time, this is going to be very good news um, for our students and also for our coaches, because those coaches are dedicated and they want to be connected with their students and they want to support them. And I know that everyone will be creative um, in making that happen. I did have a, one question um, related to the seasons. So right now would traditionally be the fall season sports starting up. And then the winter ones um, are, uh, would come later and they're postponed. So how is that transition going to work for students that may be engaged in one sport in the fall and then a different sport in the winter in terms of um, when they start or how they can continue in order to um, be prepared for their competitive season. So you want me to answer that, Dr. McComas? Uh, go ahead, um, Mr. Sai. <laughs> Thank you so much. I was sitting here thinking about how we've got math, but you'll be more no, articulate than I will be. Thank you so much. So, Mrs. Causey, so what will happen, uh, again, we talked about the first semester and the second semester. So in the first semester, we've broken it down into seasons where the coaches can work with us. And we did that purposefully just so that we made sure that this, the kids didn't have to pick and choose whether I'm going to work with the fall coach or the winter coach or the spring coach. So, for example, in, in the fall season, coaches will have from September 1st to October 23rd to work with the kids exclusively, um, virtually. Um, from the winter season, we'll have October 26th to December 11th, and then the spring we'll have uh, from December 14th to January 29th to work with the kids. So again, they don't have to pick and choose. They can take the same path they would normally do. And when we get into the actual competitive season, yeah, it looks like there's some overlaps in the dates, but the, the overlaps are actually, we built in windows of conditioning. So you're actually, one season might be conditioning when the competition is going on in another season. So kids won't be missing the competitive side of it. They'll just be missing um, the conditioning side of it for the few weeks of overlap. Okay, that's that's wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, any other board members before we move on? Again, thank you. Thank you so much. And we know that uh, all of these details will be coming out to the parents through the schools. And uh, we just appreciate that. Thank you, Ms. Causey. And um, thank you, Ms. Mr. Sai, he's, he's done a fantastic job um, on, on this plan. Thank you. Thank you. And so next we have uh, Dr. Roberts for school scheduling. Yes, good evening, board members, Mr. Causey and Dr. Williams. <clears throat> this slide is a brief overview um, and presentation of some of the parameters used by our school principals um, in selecting their bell schedules, or as you've heard earlier this evening, our virtual meeting schedules. Um, so the, the quote underneath that, that subheader really speaks to the key point in what our principals um, have been doing over these past, um, over the summer, quite frankly, in really building a schedule that's appropriate for their school community. So that term is flexibility, and you see that there. So flexibility really was the cornerstone of our schools being able to create a virtual meeting schedule that meets their school's needs, um, certainly based off the continuity of learning that we experienced in the spring and as we went into the summer. So what this slide shows you on the left-hand side are the secondary, some of the secondary parameters 
that our middle school and high school principals use and their respective leadership teams and staff and communities use um, to create their virtual meeting schedules. And on the right hand side, we'll go over some of the key points for our elementary principals. So starting um, and joining me certainly this evening before I go any further, I'd be remiss. Um, joining me is, is Mrs. Byers and Dr. Jones. Um, my colleagues, Mrs. Byers from the Central Zone and Dr. Jones from the West Zone will be assisting with um, any questions that board members have after this brief presentation. So if we start on the secondary slide in the first bullet, this goes to, I believe, um, Ms. Rowe, but I don't quite remember. There was a question from board member in terms of flexibility and the choices that principals had. I believe Ms. Rowe asked about Kenwood High School. So um, the answer to that is yes. Um, you see there in that first bullet that schools had our secondary schools had a choice between a four by four semesterized schedule. Um, it could be referred to as a four by four. You might refer to it as a block schedule. Um, so we put a four by four schedule or a four period A day B schedule where students will take four classes one day and four different classes on the second day and a seven period A day B day schedule where students will take seven classes. Um, um, again, those classes would be different, but they would take seven classes um, every day, but the rotation may change in the specials, um, but some of the core content classes would remain the same. So as the, the principals um, provided input and, and, and had conversations um, over a week's long period, we decided that the virtual meeting schedule in creating these parameters would be a combination of live and offline instruction. This was information that you saw earlier in the community, saw earlier in the draft plan that was released a few weeks ago. So it would be a combination and will be a combination of live and offline instruction, and that will be a combination of whole and small group. Um, and in that whole and small group, particularly in the small group, we're going to see an opportunity there for teachers and students to engage in remediation if needed, acceleration if needed, and or enrichment. So really one or all of those, um, depending on the student and what the content is that they're reviewing um, or that they're learning. Virtual meeting schedules, as we go into the third bullet, um, for secondary schools, and there'll be a slight difference in elementary schools that we'll talk about a little bit later. But for secondary schools, the virtual meeting schedules will begin no sooner than 8 a.m. I believe, Dr. Hager, this was referring to your question um, a little bit ago. So secondary schedules will begin at 8 a.m. and end no later than 3 p.m. Um, so we wanted to keep some continuity in general area with what our secondary schools operate. So we know our, our high schools start anywhere around 7.30, give or take 10 minutes, and our middle schools will begin um, approximately 8.15, give or take um, five or 10 minutes, um, and, and at approximately those same time frames seven hours later. So that time frame for secondary will be 8 to 3 p.m., Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, as, as you've seen in the draft plan. And the school day will not exceed the length of the normal school day. Um, and that, that point is a particular point as we go into the elementary column. Um, we'll explain that a little bit further. So as we continue on with secondary, um, feedback and input. So what our principals did um, was gather input. Once they received these parameters, um, they took the ball and they gathered feedback and input over this period um, systemically and essentially. We gathered feedback from a multitude of stakeholders around um, pros and, and deltas um, and considerations around these various scheduling options and virtual meeting schedules. So from that, our school-based leaders, again, as I said, took the ball and ran with it and continued to gather input from their leadership teams, from their teacher leaders, from their communities around what would fit best under this flexibility model for virtual meeting schedules for their specific school community. Um, so the last bullet with, as we get into the secondary is that communication of the virtual meeting schedules, um, specifically students. Um, so that bullet, what will happen is, as was mentioned earlier, as the plan is released over the course of the week and information is released um, this evening and through the course of the week, communication with the community will be part of that. Um, so students can and families can expect to see their actual schedules um, next week, beginning next week, August 17th. Um, but again, as was mentioned earlier, going into the remainder of this week, principals will receive, um, will begin sending out information um, regarding their specific school choices um, and then sharing that with their staffs, sharing that with their communities respectively as we go into, uh, as we go further into this week. So with elementary, you see some of the same parameters, but there are some unique um, issues that present themselves with our elementary at our elementary schools. 
So with elementary schools, the focus for our elementary principals is really continuing to focus on the math and ELA blocks, those being the biggest blocks of instructional time in our elementary schools. And those are supported with instruction in other core areas and special area classes. So students will certainly still be exposed to and participate in their special area classes. Um, but really that focus will continue to be as it is when we're in school under quote normal situations um, with math and ELA. Um, virtual meeting schedules will, again, as we saw in the secondary, consist of a combination of live and offline instruction, whole and small group, with the same idea around building around remediation, acceleration, and enrichment for our elementary students. Now here we see a little bit of a slight difference in the third bullet for elementary schools. Their virtual meeting schedules will not begin any sooner than 8 a.m. Um, and end no later than 4 p.m. on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, because as we know, as, again, as we've seen in the draft plan, Wednesday is an asynchronous day. Doesn't mean that learning does not occur. Learning certainly will continue, but that's an asynchronous day um, where students will be working on assignments and or projects or small group work. Um, on that day, while teachers are receiving professional learning, whether it be centralized or systemic professional learning or school-based, um, that school day, and it's important to note here, will not exceed the length of a normal school day either. So simply doing the math there, you see an 8 to 4 p.m. is an eight-hour day. That we will not, the school day will not exceed the seven-hour day. We wanted to, and we needed to provide a little bit more flexibility for our elementary schools for really two primary reasons. One being the special areas um, and the rotation of the special areas to really make sure that our students were exposed to as many of the special areas that they're accustomed to um, and deserve and need during our regular school environment. We wanted to make sure that that was offered and our principals had flexibility to build that within their um, schedules, but also because those times closely, not exactly, but certainly closely mirror what our elementary schedules would look like. It's a little bit of an earlier start time, um, but we know that some of our elementary schools do not end. Most of them will not end until about 3.30, um, and we do have some that will go until 4, in some cases a little bit after 4 o'clock. So that's why we gave, built in and provided that flexibility for our elementary principals um, with that time span there. So similar to our secondary with the last bullet, the virtual meeting schedules um, will, be provide, will be posted and available to uh, students and to uh, parents early next week. Um, however, principals, as at the secondary level, elementary principals will begin communicating out to their staffs um, as we continue into this week and then with their parents and their students in terms of what their respective schedule will look like as we begin on September 8th and certainly for teachers as they report to school um, in about two, two and a half weeks. So again, these are the um, some of the parameters that our principals use in creating their virtual meeting schedules. Um, there key again is that flexibility so principals depending on where they are and depending on their program or their programmatic needs or the programmatic offerings certainly have flexibility not only at the secondary level in their schedule but certainly in building almost like puzzle pieces and building the schedule the virtual day um, to meet the needs staying within our master agreements of our respective bargaining units and our bargaining colleagues but also certainly focusing in on our students and what they need within their respective communities so with that um, that is a, a really a, just a brief summary of our virtual meeting schedules and the bell schedules that our principals have been working really hard on over these past, um, over this summer. So again, Ms. Spires and Dr. Jones and I are available for any questions. Thank you very much for that presentation, Dr. Roberts. And we will start on the other side of the dais uh, this time. And so we will start with Ms. Rowe. Hi, yes, I just have one question. So I understand about not having the school day last more than um, the normal school day, but for elementary students, their school day is often broken up um, significantly. And I'm just wondering if there's any thought to how long throughout that school day they would be glued to devices because I don't know that I think an elementary school student can spend seven hours staring at a computer and I just want to know what the expected total amount of time is for that. No, so thank you, um, Ms. Rowe, for that question. I'm, I'm going to defer to Dr. Jones or Mrs. Byers to address um, that specific elementary question. So good evening, and um, thank you for that question, Ms. Rowe. Uh, to your point, students at the elementary level do need breaks in their day. And when they are in a brick and mortar setting, we are able to build those in. The virtual meeting schedules that our principals are designing do offer many of those breaks 
built into the day, into that seven hour day. And so mirroring what they would experience in a brick and mortar setting, they will have those breaks. And so um, it will be built in a very, the, schedule, the virtual meeting schedules will be built in a very developmentally appropriate way. So thank you because you are correct. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Ms. Scott? Um, I don't have any questions, thank you. Ms. Mack? I just have one question. Um, I believe Dr. Hager asked this, somebody asked it earlier. Um, when we eventually go back to brick and mortar classrooms, will we revert back to um, old scheduling or if the scheduling that a principal has chosen works for his or her school will the principal be allowed to follow that scheduling so this schedule the principal the schedule the virtual meeting schedules that principal choose will continue for the 2021 um, school year so it will continue through june of 2021 and it would be assessed i guess over the following summer for the next year Right. That's certainly a topic for later discussion. Right now, we're really focusing on, on getting this school year started um, appropriately, and that, that'll be um, discussed at a later time. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. McMillian? No questions. Ms. Joes? No questions. Thank you. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Um, my only question uh, concerns... Uh, CCBC uh, and other um, college, early college classes, um, how would that tie into a schedule? Yeah, I can so actually, yeah, go ahead, Dr. Jones. No, I was going to say, I can actually answer that question. Um, we're in the process of meeting with our university and college partners to really think about what that could look like, Joshua. And so you, you ask a very good question question around um, how will that be incorporated into into the schedule and each school based on the courses and or programs that students are able to participate in will be working in connection with CNI, um, our curriculum and instruction um, division, and also um, DSSA, which is our community superintendents and EDs to make sure that that is as seamless as possible and of course is able to happen within a virtual setting in some cases and or um, hybrid model depending on what the actual university and or school is implementing throughout this pandemic but you ask a really good question um, but that is going to be specific to each specific to each school and then of course tied to the programmatic needs of the colleges and universities but that is definitely going to be something that students will be able to access it just will look different based on the partnership Okay, and I have a follow up. Uh, this question might, you might not know the answer because it's a bit off topic, but um, uh, this is specific to CCBC because uh, my school does like, a, my school and I believe other schools do pro programs with them um, with some of the electives. I, uh, C initially CCBC planned to do like a hybrid return, so uh, virtual classes and uh, in person, but I, I recently noticed that most of their classes are switching to all virtual now. Um, have they communicated anything with you guys about um, whether those programs will uh, be in person or virtual, the ones that are partnered with BCPS? So, Joshua, so, we're going to have to actually take that back, but go ahead, Dr. Roberts. You no, that's exactly what I was going to say. Yep, we'll have to take that back to uh, Dr. Woolbridge. Yeah. And if you want some uh, reference, uh, some of the programs include Homeland Security um, that I know of. Uh, I've got the other ones, but. I guess you can use that for reference. Thank you. Mr. Offerman? No, none, thank you. Ms. Pasteur? Um, yes, uh, thank you uh, so much for this presentation. This is the part that I've really uh, been waiting for. Um, very, very thorough. It is well uh, mapped out. Uh, I know that the principals must appreciate 
that they were given those options, the four by four, the A, B, seven, and how it breaks down. Someone asked the question about going back um, to a regular schedule, but this certainly offers each of the schools for this year to be able to give all of our students everything they need and more. And I just have to say this one thing, um, knowing that the arts community and all sorts of communities where we normally take field trips, take children on field trips, um, and now they have more or less shut down for their physical opportunities, that they are actually available for virtual trips. I want people to be just as excited in this time, it's an awful time and, and virtual is not necessarily what we want, but we have opportunities here to give children things that many of them would not have been able to get. They will be able to take virtual trips to museums and to, to see concerts and plays. Teachers are gonna be able to do team teaching and pull their classes together and through Schoology to be able to share lessons within the school and, and throughout the county. And um, Dr. Williams knows that my word is innovation, that we are going to have opportunities to be innovative, to take something that existed and to make excellence happen with it because Public education has long needed a, a big shot of adrenaline, and this is going to make people think uh, outside of the box. So thank you so much for giving them the framework to be able to do it. And knowing the three uh, community soups, I know that it is going to happen that you and the directors are going to work with the principals so that these children get experiences that are going to take them to another level that will excite them when they get back to the real instruction. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Pesher. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Thank you. I have um, one question regarding uh, this schedule and how it will actually integrate with the slide that we just saw before regarding sports and virtual coaching and working out is the expectation that at 3 p.m. or later, and I don't know if we have a time band set up for it, but what is the expectation for students that are gonna be working with these coaches uh, on timing? So, Mr. Kuhn, I, I can offer a, a, at least an introduction to that response um, and certainly um, ask Mr. Sai to fill in. We have, we've been working certainly in coordination. Our principals in our office have been working in coordination with Mr. Sai, um, his athletics office and the curriculum and instruction um, to try to mirror the day as you see in these schedules, particularly for our secondary schools with athletic programs. Um, so with that, I don't know if Mr. Sai, in that communication, um, he will communicate those expectations because during the school day will be the school day. Um, but Mr. Sai, if there's anything you wanted to add to that um, in terms of after school or when the virtual coaching would actually take place. Um, hi, uh, Dr. Roberts. I, Mr. Sai is no longer on the call ah, with us, okay. but I will, um, I'll ensure that I communicate that with him. Um, but Mr. Kuhn, yes, to Dr. Roberts' point, we are working to approximate a school day experience as much as possible. So the idea is to get as close to that sort of sequence and flow of what is normal school um, as possible. And so primarily uh, things would be after school, but um, Mr. Sai will be communicating with uh, the athletic directors and with coaches um, and then ultimately with families as well. Thank you. Th thanks. And then the, the other question that I have, and I know I asked this question in a different format before, but I'm gonna keep asking it so I fully understand it. Um, I know that when COVID hit and we were in an emergency situation that um, the ability to provide remote learning uh, 
fell however it fell. We, we did what was possible at the time, and I believe we had some waivers as to uh, the number of hours that children received and days that they received of, of, of uh, education. So now that we are and have had time to plan for this upcoming school year, I'm looking at the fact that we have four school days and then we have Wednesdays that are going to be broken out into, as we've been told, professional development and meetings along with, <clears throat> I guess, some focus group activity and or asynchronous learning. So my question is, are we going to have the correct number of days and hours that we would normally have in a school year by, by utilizing this schedule? So Mr. Kuhn, the hours, um, this was designed, so to your point about Wednesdays, and I gave you some specifics, some examples on Wednesday. Learning continues on Wednesday. Um, so I certainly would would in, invite, um, whether it be Ms. Larry or Mr. Burke, but my, in designing this and in, in working with principals, learning continues on Wednesday. So as students are in asynchronous learning, those hours of, quote, instruction are, are incurring and they're engaged in learning activities and engaged in new learning on Wednesday. That will carry over through Thursday. Um, so specific waivers that may have been under continuity of learning, um, I can't speak specifically to that right now. Um, if one of my colleagues can, then I certainly would invite them to. However, I, I want to be clear that through this plan, Wednesday is not as for the community that Wednesdays our children are engaged in, in learning. And though there may be teachers will be engaged in professional development um, or in other activities for the day, there will be students who are working, as I mentioned, in those small groups, but students will still have work and learning that will be occurring on that Wednesday that will go towards that, that I think what you're referring to, the kind of those hours of the day. Um, but I would need to get back to you, or we'd have to get back to you on that specific question in terms of the number of mandated hours um, and MSDE's position on those hours for this 2021 school year. All right, I look forward to hearing back. Thank you. So, um, excuse me, I just want to chime in. Um, the state board gave us flexibility at the end of the school year because of the state of emergency and the pandemic. Um, the question that you raise, will we will continue to seek guidance from the state superintendent. Uh, we don't know what this year may look like. You know, we may end up uh, continuing uh, this virtual based on the pandemic, or we may be able to go back into a building. But I think a lot of what you're asking, Mr. Kuhn, is related to uh, some guidance from MSDE. And again, the plan will be submitted to them for feedback, but we will take that point in consideration. Definitely, uh, we don't want to be in a certain in a situation where it would be perceived that we're not providing the number of school days. We are providing the number of school days. We have a calendar, um, but I appreciate your point. And again, last year was different than this year. The state provided some waivers that were extremely helpful for our seniors and other students, so no one would be penalized because of the pandemic. We are still in the pandemic, and we're not sure what this school year will look like as we continue through this work. Um, with opening of a school and providing real instruction um, based on some of the things we learned this spring. And again, I want to echo that the principals and the staff and our communities have been extremely creative and supportive um, in doing what's necessary to try to keep kids engaged. So uh, we will keep that on our radar to try to provide some updates as we go along this year. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. And uh, Dr. Hager? Thank you. Um, I like this part, this plan so much as well. Thank you so much for pulling this together, especially the block schedule and so many great options for principals. So thank you for all the work you put into this. I am a little, um, I feel like disappointed is a harsh word, but um, I guess uh, disappointed in the 8 a.m. start time. So we know the American Academy of Pediatrics and lots of different um, organizations that have looked at the science, the evidence, and 
and the earliest start time they recommend for high schoolers and even middle schoolers is really 8.30. So why, why did we pick 8 a.m. and not 8.30 or even later for these older kids? So let me chime in and then Dr. Roberts or the community superintendents. So um, we picked the time that was closest to the regular school day. And keep in mind, um, by going virtual, the issue about an early start time and delaying it was about what time students had to get up and particularly had to get on the bus to get to school. So if you take that in, in consideration, uh, we're not dealing with students getting on a bus to then travel for distances. And so we, working with our partners, we decided to keep it as close to uh, the normal time um, however, during my community conversations back in the fall, that was a topic and I had to explain to the community, uh, we can't bite everything, take on everything at once. Uh, for me, it was really around the student learning, the academic, and I understand about the study. Um, I came from a system that explored this and made some changes, but Dr. Hagar, I appreciate that, but because of uh, we decided just to land on something close to the schedule, but keep in mind that that whole start time, that travel, as we, as, as I work with students in my previous position and working with community, it was the travel time, getting, getting up, getting dressed and waiting for the buses. And so we just decided to keep it as close as possible. And then we have to respect our staff as well. Uh, I think to change time, that is a much bigger conversation than turning the switch. I, I, there's a lot that goes in to um, having a later start time, but I appreciate that. Again, there was so much that came at me back a year ago that, you know, during the community conversations, and that was one that just raised. So that was our decision at this time. Uh, it's not saying we won't look at that, but at this point, particularly with reopening with a virtual, there was so much involved that we just landed to on a schedule that was closest to the current time. I don't know if anybody else wants to add in on that. No, Dr. Rizzo. No, okay. Perfect, thank you. Honestly, I think your explanation about the travel time is a really good one. So thank you, that, that, that makes me feel, it makes more sense in my mind just hearing you say that. So thank you for that answer. Um, and then my second question, my last question has to do with the special area cocktails. I noticed in the um, in the draft plan that there were a, a number of schedules where it said asynchronous or synchronous for special area classes. I was wondering if someone could talk a little bit more about the plans for those special area classes in the fall. So yeah, uh, Dr. Roberts, I can address this one because it is a primarily at the elementary level where you will see this. Um, students um, will not be engaged synchronously for the length of what might typically be a face-to-face -face special area class. Um, again, if you think about it, we want to use developmentally appropriate best practices. And so um, in order to ensure that they have some of those breaks and can take breaks and organize their asynchronous independent learning time, um, where typically they would have at the elementary level a 50-minute special area class, we did not want their special area time to be 50 minutes of online synchronous learning. So it will be a blend. Sorry, so th their own art teacher will teach them for a portion of the time and then they will do something on their own. Is that, is that what you mean? That is correct. Okay, thank you. No, those are all my questions. Thank you. And. Um, I'll just go last and I do also appreciate all of the work that's been done. Um, I appreciate the fact that the principals were given options to consider for their community. Uh, the uh, choice between a four by four with semester classes, uh, the four period A day B day, which is um, what high schools have been using um, the last several years. And then the seven period day, which is uh, what most of the middle schools are used to. Um, I especially appreciate that uh, the board in February of 2019 voted to approve uh, BCPS's school day task force recommendation to allow semester classes um, where the principals and their communities decide that that's appropriate and where it has approval from the central office. Um, and some of those benefits 
um, include the students only having four classes to focus on for the first semester and this, at the high school level and teachers only having to teach three classes and then moving forward hopefully into a hybrid uh, with in-person instruction in the second semester it will limit the interactions of teachers and students in terms of um, how many classrooms they have to go to the teachers it will limit the number of um, classes that they are teaching so um, that can be helpful in uh, limiting infections or in um, uh, managing any any response that's needed. Um, so that's uh, so we really appreciate the principals being given those options. Um, I think the board has had good discussions, so I will um, I, I will finish my remarks with that. So if there isn't any other board uh, comment or question about the bell schedules, we appreciate all the work that's going into it and that uh, families will be getting the information as uh, is pointed out by August 17th. Um, so everyone will know shortly and then be able to plan with their students. Okay. Thank you. So the next item of business is- I'm sorry, Ms. Causey, let me just, just chime in. I just wanna thank the design, the design team, our stakeholder groups, all of those um, who have been involved, our COVID, 19 task force our partnerships with our county agencies especially department of health um, this has been such a great opportunity to collaborate and to think differently in how we educate students and i just want to emphasize i appreciate the board's questions um, and i appreciate the feedback again um, we're gonna we're going to constantly work with our our principals. Now we're at the point where our principals, our teacher leaders, our unions are are waiting to start the school year, and and so with that we're going to be providing some information to our our principals tonight, our union presidents tonight, um, and tomorrow because they are really ready to get ready for the start of the school year. But I. I would be remiss if I did not thank all of those staff members, all of our principals, all of our team BCPS for the hours and days um, that they have been working to have a plan because the, the emphasis and the focus will always be on the students as well as our staff. And so I just wanted to thank the team, thank Mr. Burke and uh, all of cabinet but definitely the design team, our stakeholders group, because uh, without them, we would have no plan. And so I want the board to be assured we're going to meet the deadline by sharing our plan with the state, with Dr. Salmon, and we're you know, eager to get their feedback, but I wanted to just emphasize that hard work that folks have been, do have been doing since the closing of school that I, again, I would be remiss if I did not just again thank the team for their hard work. So thank you, Team BCPS. Thank you, absolutely, Dr. Williams. So our next item on the agenda is um, new business action taken in closed session. Um, Mr. Nussbaum? I don't believe any action was taken in closed session. That is, that sounds correct, thank you. The next item then is new business contract awards. And for that, we call on Dr. Scriven, Mr. Saris, and Mr. Dixit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Saris, you can start us off, followed by Mr. Dixit. Uh, thank you both. Uh, yes, just want to point out that um, in building and contracts committee uh, that was chaired by Ms. Rowe, uh, I believe that the committee recommended uh, to approve items one through 15. And I'm, Mr. Dixon and I are happy to answer any further questions that the full board may have at this time. So do I have a motion to approve items N1 through N15? So moved, Ro. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. 
No second is needed since the recommendation comes from the committee. Is there any discussion? Hearing no questions, may I have a roll call vote? Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Ms. Kazi? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. And I do want to thank Ms. Rowe for chairing the Building and Contracts Committee earlier today uh, because Ms. Hen was unavailable. Thank this you, Mr. Saris. This is Causey. Yes. Thank you. Like a motion. Excuse this me. Causey. Yes. Um, is this Mr. McMillian? Yeah. I'll okay. Like motion. I move that the Baltimore County Board of Education solicit an RFP for board legal counsel services through BCPS Office of Purchasing following appropriate procurement guidelines. Second, Josh Mamza. Um, point of order, me. this is not an item on the agenda. Um, Mr. Mr. McMillian, um, this is not an item on the agenda. Um, so I will have to say that it's out of order. We had a conversation with within the board about uh, board members having information ahead of the board meeting, things being on the agenda so that we could properly consider things. So if you would like to uh, submit that item for consideration for the next agenda, then uh, we can process that request. Point of uh, order, Ms. Causey, this is Ms. Jost. Can we get legal counsel from Mr. Nussbaum? Um, because this is related to building and contracts, so I don't see why he cannot make a motion as a board member in open session. Mr. Nussbaum, could so you please was, clarify? Ex excuse me, Ms. Joes. Um, so, Mr. McMillian, was this issue raised in the Building and Contracts Committee? No, ma'am. Okay. Mr. Nussbaum, if you would, um, if you would uh, give us guidance on the point of order that this is not an agenda item. Yeah, I, I, I agree with the chair that this is not on the agenda and shouldn't be, uh, it, it could be added to the, it could have been added to the agenda at the beginning of the meeting, but it wasn't. I think it's outside the uh, agenda. Okay, thank you. All right, so Mr. McMillian, if you can send your request, um, then we'll process that uh, at the next agenda setting meeting. Thank you. Thank you. So the next item on the agenda is the new business report on the fiscal year 2022 state capital budget and for that we call for dr scriven mr saris and mr dixit thank you so much madam chair uh, we are pleased to present the superintendent's proposed fy 2022 state capital budget uh, recommendation and process I will now ask Mr. Dixit to review our schedule of next steps with moving forward. Mr. Dixit, uh, can you please uh, take us through this presentation? Thank you, Dr. Scriven. Uh, good evening, board, uh, Chair Biscosi, uh, board members, and Superintendent Dr. Williams. Uh, as Dr. Scriven indicated, we are here to introduce the state capital program for FY 2022. In the attachment, you'll find a proposed state capital request for 22, final copy of the state and county that was approved for 2021, and a schedule for the FY 22 state capital program. As a refresher to the board members, and especially uh, for the new board members, Dr. Hager and Mr. Mamzan, the capital program includes state and county participation, 
it deals with construction of schools, replacement, renovation, and systemic projects. They have two different cycles, one for state, the other one for county, and they meet at the end. So all of the construction, renovation is funded through this capital program. Today is the start of the capital state capital cycle. What we are requesting you is to review uh, the proposal that we are submitting to you tonight. The next board meeting, there'll be a work session where we pre present in detail as to what this program is, how did we develop it. In the meantime, if you have any questions, please submit it to us and we'll respond in writing to you. We appreciate if the questions are submitted by August 17th. And then the, the timeline for this is that board session is scheduled as I indicated for August 25th. Final approval will be requested at the September 25th meeting and submission to state by October 7th of this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dixon, for that um, information. And um, board members will be uh, submitting their questions by August 17th. Um, and then we will discuss all of this at the board work session. So the next item on the agenda is the report on the multi-year improvement plan for all schools. And for that, we will also have Dr. Scriven and Mr. Dixit report. And following the presentation, we'll allow time for discussion if the board desires. So once again, Madam Chair, thank you for this opportunity and to members of the board, Dr. Williams, uh, to ensure the effective application of capital funds, the need has been acknowledged to evaluate our current systems and structures in order to develop a multi-year improvement plan for all schools. Such a program must support equity in the allocation of resources and be able to deliver educationally appropriate modern school buildings effectively and cost efficiently. At this time, Mr. Dixit will provide an update on our multi-year improvement plan for all schools. Mr. Dixit. Thank you, Dr. Scriven again, and good evening, everybody. As Dr. Scriven indicated, and as you'll recall, uh, board members have been asking for a multi-year capital improvement plan. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the efforts made by board chair, Ms. Causey, and some of the other board members in helping us finding funds and uh, creating this need and developing this program. So county has agreed to fund this multi-year capital improvement plan. And I'll just talk a little bit about it because we are, we are providing a supporting role to an initiative that is county's funding and county has used their procurement process to, to start this plan. So what is multi-year plan? What is the contract and schedule? What are some of the communities committees and focus group, and the mechanism for community input. Next slide, please. The next one. So multi-year improvement plan for all school is a multi-year plan for identifying and prioritizing capital needs for Baltimore County Public School. Superintendent has made it very clear from day one that it should be founded on the guiding principles of objective data, stakeholder participation, inclusion, and total transparency. In order to meet that, we have three pillars under that program. The first one is enrollment projections. The second is educational adequacy and equity. And the third is facilities assessment. Next slide, please. The Baltimore County government, with our collaboration, began the selection process for a consultant on November 1, 2019. The consultant was selected on March 10th, 
the name of the company is Canon Design Group. And as you will recall, schools and offices were closed on March 13th due to pandemic. So immediately, uh, the consulting company, uh, with our collaboration, started changing from bricks and mortar to a, a digital uh, interactive session type of meeting. Next, next slide, please. The notice to proceed with the consultant was given on April 1st, and the target for Canon, even though we are starting late, and even though we are changing it to a virtual setting, the phase one for high school continues to be the fall of 2020. The phase two will have little more time and we still have till fall of 2021 to complete that. Next slide, please. With the help of our county partners, we have created five committees. One is the executive oversight, the second is the technical oversight, and third, fourth, fifth are for the individual pillars that will form the basis for this evaluation. All of the school buildings will be looked at through the lens of enrollment projections, capacity and utilization, educational adequacy and equity, and facilities condition assessment. There are committees and focus groups for each of these, and some of you already have been part of the conversation. Next slide, please. All of the focus group will meet throughout the study, and those focus groups include members of the Baltimore County Public Schools, our administration, Baltimore County Government, Board of Education of Baltimore County, County Council, community members, and area councils. Next slide, please. Canon has already scheduled a series of interactive sessions with each of the focus groups. They have been a little behind their timelines because it took them a little while to change from brick and mortar to virtual setting. But as you'll recall, some of the board members here have been part of the different focus group and they have been part of the conversation. Next slide, please. In addition to the focus groups, there are opportunities for the community input. There was an online survey that was conducted from July 1st to July 15th. It was made available in nine languages. And then there's an online comment form. And in that comment form, comments can be submitted throughout the My iPass and, and it will be compiled and evaluated throughout the study. Canon is compiling those uh, comments and including in their rubric that they are using for each of those pillars that we talked earlier. Next slide, please. At this time, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. If I can get you the answer now, I'll pass it on to Canon and get the answers for you. I encourage all the board members that have been part of it to try to attend and appreciate your time. With that, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Dixit, and I appreciate you acknowledging um, board members that have been working on this issue uh, for quite some time as we've been on the board longer than other <clears throat> board members. Uh, and Ms. Hen, who's not here this evening, was certainly a part of that. And also um, Ms. Rowe, as a parent advocate, uh, started a massive movement for equitable facilities for BCPS schools. So this is really a um, fruition of hard work by so many people in terms of really trying to apply equitably the funds that we get from our multiple partners. Um, so with that, I see folks that have questions. Ms. Joes? I believe Mr. Kuhn had his hand up first. He can go. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Dixit, on one of the slides uh, under contract and schedule, 
you listed phase one high schools by fall 2020. So can you describe what the expectation is at the end of phase one? Thank you for your question. It's a good question. Um, as you know that as placeholder in our existing capital program, we had three high schools, Lansdowne, Towson, and Delaney. Design funds for Lansdowne were already approved and the other two schools were still placeholders. Uh, the, the, our goal is to make an attempt to come up with a list of recommendations from the consultant based on their evaluation of all of the high schools based on those pillars that I talked about in the presentation. So we were hoping to get that recommendation by late August or September, but obviously we started late. So we still are shooting for uh, late fall. Uh, and that should not have a major impact on our capital schedule because we can still make some changes in our state submission by late fall, um, late October, I believe. And we can also make changes to our county capital program, which we'll bring to you uh, in December, January time period. Just so that I'm, I'm clear, something else that you stated is that um, Canon, I had to immediately kind of change their approach and do this in a more virtual way. And if my understanding is correct, part of what they were supposed to do is go to every school and actually do a thorough review and walkthrough. Is that accurate? That is accurate and they are still doing that. They have been, their team has visited every school and looked at it from the lens of all disciplines of engineering. The virtual setting, what it has replaced is instead of big town hall community meetings, we'll have virtual sessions. And even though it required adjustment, there has been robust discussion. And Ms. Rowe has been part of some conversation there. She can share with you. Uh, if I remember right, Ms. Pasture has been part of some of the conversation. So it's just that we had to change uh, the method of operation, or Canon has to change that, but the robust dialogue continues. And thank you, Mr. Dixit. My last and actual concern stems from <clears throat> the um, the timing of the online survey and the online comment form. Uh, I believe they're made available uh, July 1st through the July 15th. And as we all know, that is, you know, a perfect time for people to be on vacation and not paying attention to emails that they're getting from the school system since they all just finished up <laughs> uh, school for the year. So my concern is, and I don't know if there's a way to measure this. Okay, um, it is a legitimate concern, but based on the responses that Canon has received, there were more than 22,000 responses. And it included, it included representation with, from teachers, from employees, from community members, from students. Um, we were all pleasantly surprised that more than 2,500 students participated in the survey. Board members, even though it is only 11 board members, but there were 19 board member responses. So obviously some of you responded twice. So there has been an active participation and we are happy about it. In addition to that, the online comment form will remain open throughout the study. So we, you know, we all encourage you to submit your comments for evaluation by Canon. Ms. Does that complete your questions, Mr. Kuhn? I'm not quite sure where where you lost me. I, <laughs> I noticed my Wi-Fi literally kicked out as I was speaking. I was just pointing out that 
July 1st through 15th is a difficult time for people to be engaged in online surveys uh, regarding something this important. So I didn't know if there was a way to possibly provide another 15 day window. Uh, if I, if I have chairs uh, approval, I can repeat my response. Yes, please repeat it. Okay, so uh, what I was saying, that was the concern that we had for a while too, but based on responses, we have received more than 22,000 responses, including 2,500 students and 19 responses from board members. And literally thousands and thousands of responses. They are all being compiled and at some point, Canon will be glad to share that with you. So there was no shortage of the responses. There was active participation and we are grateful for it. And, and, and also, Pete, excuse and you, me. Go ahead, go ahead, Ms. Causey. I think we were gonna say the same thing. Yes, and also Mr. Kuhn, what you missed was that Mr. Dixit, Mr. Dixit explained that there is a continual comment that is available. Mr. Dixit, could you explain what method where uh, stakeholders can find that comment? Yeah, there is an online comment form that will uh, remain open throughout the study and anybody can comment on that and we encourage everybody to submit their comment. It helps us if the comment is uh, relevant to the study because we have received several comments that are not relevant to the study, but in general comments on other matters. So if you can focus your comment on the multi-year improvement plan, Canon is looking at it, including that in their rubric and in their evaluation instruments, and they will compile it and share it with you at some point. Thank you, no further questions. Ms. Joes. Thank you. Uh, firstly, Mr. Dixit, thank you for uh, putting this together and including all those focus groups. Um, I think my focus group is also coming up. Something that just struck me was that you said out of the 25,000 responses, 22,000 were students. No, 22,000 responses, 2,500 students. 2,500, okay. And then you said 19 board members. We have 12, so Not I was a bit confused. 19 responses from the board members. So it appears that some board members have sent more than one response and which is okay. You can submit as many responses and as many comments as you want. Okay. And, um, you know, I do want to uh, applaud the county as well for taking part in this as somebody that does capital improvement projects. I was really appalled that BCPS did not have a 10 year or a multi year capital project and um, and I'll say it out there up front, it might ruffle some feathers, but I'm known to ruffle feathers. Um, when I came to the school system facility as an engineer, what I saw was disproportionately the schools that were attended by minorities were in shambles and the system had schools that were in pretty good shape and those were predominantly uh, non-majority school systems. And I've asked that to the school system for the past two years. And, you know, I've gotten a, a, a variety of responses uh, that's been teetering around trying not to upset people. But to me, one of the key things of having this is to make sure that our facilities are equitable, that our disenfranchised children, whether it's on the east or west, whether it's Sparrows Points or Lansdowne, are not failing. And we don't give schools just to um, the people that are always clamoring for it, but it should go to our needs based. And um, that's why I'm glad that you have these different focus groups with equity and with uh, facilities. And I, I am appreciate being a part of it as well. So my question is, when the capital project comes back to the board, will that include all of that focus groups, the equity portion in terms of reviewing it with an equity lens as well, as well as needs based and not just community based? Um, to the board for approval and what, what is the timeline for that? Okay, so you have a lot of, you have a lot of questions in there. Let me just uh, take one at a time. Number one, yes, superintendent made it a point that adequacy and equity both are considered and we are grateful for that. Our board chair from day one that I have heard her, she has been insisting about the multi-year plan and 
uh, I'm so happy to see that it has finally come to conclusion and I'm very optimistic about it. So thank her for that. The final thing is about the equity. There are two things in there. Most of these pro projects uh, have a better chance because of the way we are funded if there are there is increasing enrollment because the emphasis on the uh, on the capital plan for past several years have been taking care of the enrollment. So that's one of the answers to one of your questions. The final thing is the equity condition assessment and capacity utilization. These are three pillars and there's a numerical score assigned to each one of the pillars. Now adequacy and equity will have a, will have their share of the score. It, it may improve the chance of an older school or inequitable school, but it may not put at the top because the condition and, and the capacity utilization are still major factors, but it will be. This will be the first time where equity is part of the evaluation of our schools. So it it is for the first time that you are using equity into the motion or into the mix, and you how are you weighing these uh, criteria? Whether it's capacity, which I believe would be have a higher weighted average over uh, facility condition. So would that be in uh, you know would we know how you're weighing those averages? Yeah, those those, criteria? Av those averages, the the assigned score to each category, that rubric is quite complex and at some point Canon will share that with you, but to make it really easy to understand, it includes hundreds of different criteria and it try, it, it develop, they have developed a rubric based on their experience and based on community um, comments. So in your focus groups, you are participating in interactive sessions and based on that data, they fine tune their rubric. Thank you. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this because I do want to see a change in Baltimore County Public Schools, and I want to make sure that our facilities are equitable and for everybody based on needs and not political um, demands. What I've seen that was appalling to me as an engineer that, uh, you know, lots of things are being superseded by community demands as opposed to needs based. So I'm really excited about this, and I look forward to looking at the cap, uh, looking forward to reading that capital uh, report. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Hi, Mr. Dixit. I just have a couple questions. Sure. In the process of doing this, one of the things that I've noticed as I've looked at the 2014 facilities assessment and the different processes by which the county selects projects is that quite often what happens is areas of the school system where developers have uh, um, developments that they want to do end up with overcrowded schools and consequently those end up also being some of the more wealthier schools and the older neighborhoods that have a lot of rental units where there's no room for development those schools end up being both under capacity and in poor conditions because the county is expanding development so fast that there are always overcrowded schools that are always taking the same money so we end up with the same communities and the same areas of the county getting a lot of money to, to alleviate overcrowding. At the same time, there are other school facilities that their communities uh, like Colgate and Dundalk, for instance, had to really fight hard to get the schools rebuilt because it wasn't overcrowded. It was just that things were falling apart so badly that the children couldn't go to school there anymore. So uh, what I want to know is, is this study going to adequately weight the school conditions? Because some of these schools are beyond what the IAC would consider their um, window of life cycle and they're at the point where preventative maintenance can no longer expand the life cycle and these schools need either significant renovations or complete rebuilding but they are not really going to be overcrowded in most cases because there may not be developments. And in many cases, those are also the same areas 
where there are a lot of minorities going to school. So uh, like Hawthorne Elementary, for instance, probably isn't ever going to be overcrowded, but the school is very old. It's probably one of the worst conditioned schools in my district, and it is majority African American with over 70% free and reduced meals. So in that situation, what's going to happen with a school like that? So it, it's a good question. It's a good question and it's a complex question. We have been struggling, we as a system have been struggling trying to get the right answer for that question. Our needs are far greater than the funds available. County has made tremendous improvement in funding in the last few years, and we are extremely grateful for that. But even now, our needs are far greater than the funding stream. Hopefully, our goal is to get from this study that what is the funding that is needed? How long is it going to take for us to take care of all the needs based on current level of funding? And how much funding will be need, needed to shorten that cycle? so that we can get to some of those schools that are in bad condition or the areas where we need additional seats. And that's the best answer I can give you right now based on what I know. But as you participate in some of these sessions that you have, and when you get the result of this study, hopefully some of these questions will be answered by a lot more qualified people than I am at this time. Mr. Dixit, are we going to see all of the data about facilities conditions, previous spending on facilities, along with the poverty and racial breakdown of the facilities? We have shared with Canon whatever they have asked from us, and county has shared every bit of information, and we have requested a state, and whatever information we had, we have passed it on to Canon. So all that I can tell you is that we are sharing everything with you, with them and what they will use and how they will use, um, you'll be part of the conversation as we go along. Okay, so at what point when they give all that compiled data back to the school system, will the board be able to see it as a collection of data that's comprehensive that they collected? The final report is projected to be next year, uh, fall of 21. But the initial recommendation for the high school part only, we are shooting for the fall of this year. Okay, thank you. The next hand up I see is uh, Dr. Hager, and then I have a question, and we'll see who else has a question after that. Dr. Hager. Thank you, and this is an area where I have a steep learning curve. It's definitely not um, not up my alley, so I apologize if, if uh, this may not make sense, but I'm kind of building off of what Lily said. So is Canon developing their own rubric? Is that what's happening with, with the data that they're using? Is there not a kind of an existing and acceptable rubric nationally for making these decisions? They are, they have a rubric that they have used in the past for other school system, but each community, each school system has their unique set of needs. So that's why they have these interactive sessions to find out what is the need for Baltimore County public school community. In case of equity, there may be needs from community to community, and they have a way to get all of that together, incorporate in their rubric, and come up with an evaluation instrument. Okay, I, I echo the concern about the um, weight of the community input and the um, enrollment data, just because, just like they said, that, that could create an inequitable score moving forward, um, so, and then, my second or my question is, um, so there is a list of 11 schools on the capital budget request form that were either to be new or um, or rebuilt. And so will all of those schools be put forward to the state or is this process to identify which of those um, schools will be put forward for new buildings this year? Okay, the list that you have in front of you, uh, the attachment that says fiscal year 2022 submission, Mm -hmm. This is for request of state funds for the projects that have been approved by the previous board. The okay. ones that are completed, they are taken off the list and new projects are added. New projects are primarily added based on the capacity need. A lot of this program is driven by capacity and 
infrastructure needs. Also in the past three, four years, there was need for air conditioning. So a big portion of capital program, a couple of hundred million dollars were spent to air condition about 50% of the school that did not have air conditioning. So each year we identify themes for a capital program. And this year it appears to be continuation of capacity needs, modernization of infrastructure, and inclusion of high schools wherever we can. In the past, we have taken care of a lot of our elementary schools and middle schools, but we have not been able to do high schools to that extent. For the past couple of years, we have renovated two high schools, and the other two high schools that we wanted to renovate, communities didn't want renovation, they wanted new schools. So we could not complete those renovations. Did I answer your question? You asked a very good I question. So. I want to make, sure. I, want to make sure I provide an equally good response. <laughs> no, it's, it's really great. I'm still learning. Um, but so the, those 11 schools are, are set to be either rebuilt or have new schools built. And that so the multi-year plan is for new schools, not those 11. That's right. The, the schools that are in this plan, they are called legacy projects. So any school that has been funded totally for design or has been funded by county and we are waiting for state funds, that is not part of this program, this multi-year plan. This is to look forward, well, how we should do from here on. Got and it. So next, year, next year. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, Mr. Dixit, my question relates to uh, four uh, prior questions, um, but we have established an equity committee, and I wondered if uh, the chair of that committee, Ms. Scott, um, wanted to um, talk a little bit about the equity audit that um, her committee is working on with the school system, because I think that um, when you when we are discussing equity within our school district, um, the data is important. Um, so, Ms. Scott, I don't know um, if you wanted to comment about that or if we want to just make sure that um, you as the chair of the equity committee are um, involved in this process uh, so that the work of the equity committee can be folded into this work where appropriate. Oh, great. Thank you um, very much for giving me the opportunity to speak about the committee and um, the audit as a, uh, the equity audit. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, participate in one of the sessions that Mr. Dixit spoke about and um, to uh, be a part of the focus group and, and to talk about that. We are still compiling it and we will um, eventually be able to speak more about it. I think it would be premature to speak about it at this point as it is still coming together, but we intend to have a full report that we will bring to the full board out of the committee that will um, it, uh, basically talk about where we are where we are currently, what we're doing, and um, how we're going forward. But again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity um, to speak about that. And um, I hope everyone is excited as, as we are on the committee to um, share that um, with the full board. Yes, that will be great. And uh, so meanwhile, I would just ask um, Dr. Williams and Mr. Dixit to um, uh, include Ms. Scott uh, where appropriate in terms of really honing in on the equity work that's being done. Other board members? Ms. Causey, this appreciate is Lisa that. Mack. Ms. Causey. Sorry. Oh, Absolutely, sorry, Ms. Mack. Uh, go ahead, uh, Ms. Ms. Mack. Mr. Dixit. Yes, ma'am. So did we throw away money on the high school capacity study, or, or, or are we going to use any of that data at all? Whenever we do these kind of study, it is added knowledge that we need. You know, just one study uh, is, is never complete. So, so we have passed on, they asked for a copy of that. Canon asked for a copy of old GWWO study we have shared with them. How much of that they will use, it depends on their rubric, but they know everything that was done in high school study. 
it, you know, you you hire four consultants, they look at the same problem and they look at way. it from different angles. And, and, and everybody adds some value to the process. So I wouldn't say that we threw the money away. Uh, how much of it is useful? Uh, let the result of Canon speak for themselves. So, okay, my next question, I guess I looked at this a little differently. When I look at the cap, the, the projects, the list that has 40 schools on it, did I he hear you say in answer to Dr. Hager's question that the schools that are on here with the words under project, either new school or replacement school, there will be no changes to that? Is that a true statement or did I misunderstand? No, you understood it right. If you look at that attachment and you go at all the way up to the Lansdowne High School, so all of those schools have already been funded by county including the design for Lansdowne High School. Anything below that, if there's a new project or future project, that will be impacted. So any high school other than Lansdowne is not included. Okay. You know, that's going to be part of this study. Thank you for that clarification. And then my last question is, yeah, uh, I know that we've been asking for a 10-year plan, but 10 years is a long time. Will there be a provision in this plan if something happens where there is a big change for a school that's further down to get moved up or is it cast in stone when it gets on the 10-year plan? Now, I'm not the final authority to answer that question, but I can tell you based on my experience looking at other county school systems, they look at these plans periodically after three, four, five years. And if there is any change warranted, they go back to the school board and county council to say that this, pro this program was developed seven years ago and these changes have taken place. So sometimes they incorporate it, sometimes changes are approved, sometimes they are not. But it will be reasonable to assume that if there will be changes coming five years down the road, then you or I or all of us will get a chance to look at it one more time. Okay, and just one more clarification. So for high schools, it would not, this, there could be changes to Delaney, Towson, Parkville, well, I'm sorry, Parkville's a, a roof replacement. Based on the outcome of the Canon study, Delaney and Towson could be moved yeah. off of this list. Is that a correct statement? That's a correct statement. That will, any future of high school program after Lansdowne will be developed by Canon in this report. And that, that recommendation will be made to school board and to the county council. And if everybody approves it, then we'll move forward. All right, thank you very much. And thank you for your work on this, Mr. Dixit. Thank you, thank you for your questions. So I have two board members that already spoke that want to speak again, but is there any board member that has not yet uh, spoken that would like to uh, ask a question or make a comment? Okay, then we'll go with uh, Ms. Rowe and then Ms. Joes. Mr. Dixit, I forgot to ask what question. You and sure, I have spoken sure. about this before and how the IAC has been working on for a couple years now, changing their guidelines and their funding formula so that it weights facilities condition um, included with overcrowding and not just overcrowding being so heavy weighted. And I know that they're in the process of getting um, facilities condition reports from all the school systems so they can apply those formulas that, um, to the new funding. Can you tell me two things? What year will the new formulas take effect for the funding process? And is Canon aligning their rubric with the state's um, new um, facili adequate facilities formula? Okay, there are some questions in there that I don't have the answers to. So schedule for states to study is different than our schedule. We are planning to complete our study by next year. Canon is aware of what state is planning to do. They know exactly what they're doing, but every consultant has slightly different methodology and everybody has a different schedule. In order for us to align 100% with the state, we'll have to wait for states' schedule to complete their 
uh, uh, their evaluation, which may take several years. So what you will see here is a condition assessment by Canon, evaluation of capacity and enrollment projection, review of that by Canon, and Canon's development of rubric for adequacy and equity. So what happens if the list that they come up with that we all approve ends up being different than the priority list that the state hands us for funding? Well, the state does not decide local priorities. Local priority is always decided by local school board and local administration. Are they not changing that? They are not changing. Our, the priority of project that you see in the attachment is developed by us, by the superintendent, by the board. Okay, so it's, you don't you don't think that they're waiting a facilities condition is going to make some of our projects that are heavily dependent on overcrowding um, change at all? Well, they may change their funding parameters for each project, but they will not change priority of our project, which is a state. I see. Local. Okay, thank you. Ms. Jones? Mr. Dixit, when you're talking about this multi-year program and um, plan and you just spoke, answered one of the questions is, this is gonna be some kind of a working living document that's gonna keep getting updated because priorities and may keep changing through the years because an attack and capital plan is really not that long because by the time you prioritize a project, you can put it into planning, design, construction. It essentially is a six to eight year period. So will this keep getting updated and will this keep coming back to the board as priorities and funding formulas and rubric changes because one size does not fit all. And so this has to be tailored to specifically Baltimore County Public Schools. And I don't know if I answered my own question, but does that keep, is this a living document that will keep getting updated like a, i.e. a 10 year CIP plan? I think part of the question you answered yourself, but let me provide some additional information. Uh, you are right in saying that project takes four, five, six years to complete sometime. By the time we start talking about high school, we getting planning approval to the funding and construction. It may be five to seven year cycle. So while it is a living document, the life of the document is not one or two or three years. It is a lot more than, a lot longer than that. So what will happen 10 years from now? We don't know. How much changes in the enrollment? We don't know. But one thing we know that the condition of the building is it is easy to project that as to what will happen 10 years. If a building is new, we can project what it would be, how much degradation would be in the next 10 years under reasonable condition. If the building is falling apart now, it's going to be even worse in 10 years. So there is some reasonable projection for 10 years. So one third or so of the evaluation is the condition. The other third or so, whatever the rubric indicates, is the capacity. Capacity may change, but still from what we have seen, in most of the cases, there are solid trends for enrollment projections. Yes, there are deviations. So there may be a few percent cases where it may deviate. And that's when we'll come to board and, and indicate that. And that happens even now that when the conditions change, some of the projects we may bring to you next time, we may change the priority based on new information. So at that time, it will be board's prerogative to change the priority of those projects. Even if we follow the document, and if there are some changes that are convincing changes, in my mind, board still has the authority to change that. I don't know if I answered your question or not, but I tried. Um, um, yes, you did, thank you. And I also wanna point out that the 10 year census uh, is ongoing right now. So a lot of the studies are using census data for projecting those enrollment numbers, at least as part of the um, base data that they use, and then they get the rest of it from local um, census jurisdictions. So my question is, 
essentially, yes, they will look into capacity using census numbers. They will look into the building uh, condition assessment, maintenance plans, but eventually it all boils down to how do we cohesively bring it together in an equitable yeah. fashion and make it into a more humane document and not just a technical document uh, without taking into consideration the human factor, which is what I think is important for us to consider as a board. Um, but I think you answered some of my questions, so thank you. Miss um, Causey, can I just ask a clarifying question to that conversation? Yes, Ms. Mack. Mr. Dixit, for as long yes, as I've been on the board, every time you present this sheet, I asked you the same question, and you and Mr. Smith at the time, now Mr. Scriv Dr. Scrivens, um, you, I would say, can there be any changes to this sheet? And I think your answer always was, Ms. Mack, if we make any changes to this sheet, we put state dollars at risk. But I think I just heard you say to Ms. Joes that we can change it as we need to change it. So do we, are we not, do, do we not have that risk with state funding by making changes to a document that we submit to them? It's, it's a very good question and thank you for asking that. We try our best to be consistent with this document because there is a continuous dialogue with us and our fiscal partners, that's county, and state both. So if we decide to change too frequently, too many projects, you are right, our statement is always right. But if there are major changes in enrollment projections, or if there are major changes in the condition of the uh, systemic part, then yes, we, we should change. We go back change. and make that argument. We, yeah, we make that argument. And as okay. you know, that after this thing is approved, there is a document, there's a plan that is submitted to state which is four times thicker than the old Verizon telephone directory. And it's a uh -oh. huge document with every bit of information about the neighborhood, about the community, about the enrollment, about the condition of the building. So they know all about it that we know. So when we make a change, if ever, we share with them why are we making this change and justify it. Okay, thank you. I, I just, I know it's a question I ask often, and it's a question you have answered for me many times, and I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Any other board members with questions for Mr. Dixit? Okay. Uh, Ms. Roy, was your hand still up, or is that from before? I would just like a copy of the four times thicker than the phone book document if it's you, submitted to you, the state. You already have it from last oh, year. So yeah. it's the state submission you're talking about. Okay, That's thank right. you. <laughs> okay, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Dixit. Ms. Joes, is your hand still up or is that from before? I think no. that's from before. Okay, great. Okay, well, thank you very much, Mr. Dixit, for all of that information. And this is a project and a process that will move forward. And um, as you said, the board will continue to get updates and the public um, and the communities will be involved in the process. So thank you very much. And thank you for your support. Absolutely. So the next item on the agenda is board member comments. And for that, we will um, go around the dais and this time we will start with uh, Ms. Rowe. I just want to say that I'm very glad that we're getting moving on the um, facilities plan and that we have an equity committee now. And there's a lot of things that when I, even before I was on the board, that I wanted to see our school system work on. And we're seeing a lot of that take place now. And it's progressing, even though we're in the middle of a global pandemic. And I think that every board member is to be commended for um, working on these issues, but also our school system staff is doing a lot of work also in cooperation with um, the superintendent and the board. And I'm, I really am grateful that there's patience among everyone to be able to look at issues that maybe someone else is their focus issue, but they want to work on something else. And I'm glad that we're able to do that as a board 
and as a school system is to be able to work on many different things at one time and really focus on those things and not operate in silos. And I see a lot less operating in silos in the school system now than before we had an elected board. And so I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And I really look forward to seeing the future work that we're going to do together. And with that, I just hope that all of our families are well and that people are staying healthy and um, that uh, when virtual learning starts that students will be um, refreshed as they can be from the summer and be ready to start. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just would like to commend again, the, as I've said before, the staff, Dr. Williams, um, for uh, the job that they're doing in these unprecedented times um, during the whole COVID-19 pandemic, um, supporting our children, supporting our parents, supporting our community, answering questions. Um, I just feel they should be acknowledged for the work that they are doing, they have done, and will continue to do. And I would like to um, just say how um, proud I am of all of the work that they're doing and that um, I fully support them. And I would also like to um, look forward to the upcoming year. It's different, it's virtual. But I feel that um, we are moving forward in a, in a good direction, and I look forward to hearing more updates as to how it progresses and ways we as a board can support the staff as we move forward. So thank you again for that, and I hope everyone has a good evening. Ms. Mack? Ms. Mack? Okay, we'll move on to Mr. McMillian. I was muted, sorry. Okay, Ms. Mack. No, I just wanted to say a thank you to Dr. Williams and his staff for um, the work they've done and the information they provided tonight. Um, like to say to teachers and administrators, um, I, I know administrators have worked through the summer, but I also know that a lot of teachers have worked through the summer trying to test out um, different ways of, of showing data to each other. And um, I, I wish administrators, um, teachers, students, and parents um, the best in the upcoming next two weeks as school gets ready to start. Mr. McMillian? Mr. McMillian? If Mr. McMillian is not with us right now, we I will... Am. Oh, there you are. With you. Are you okay? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, good. I have two points that I want to make. I have the utmost trust and confidence in Dr. Williams and his staff and all the decisions that they make in regards to, to the reopening. And secondly, in March, when we closed down, I said publicly that this was going to change the faith of public education for the better. I'm very excited to see our new direction because we have to change the way that we've been operating over the many decades before now. Thank you. Ms. Joes? Thank you. Um, thank you once again. I'm going to re re repeat what a lot of other board members have said. Thank you, Dr. Williams and staff for working so hard on this reopening entry plan to all the teachers and principals. And I hope all of our students have a great academic year ahead. Um, thank you. Good night. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Um, I hate to be too repetitive, but I also want to reiterate uh, uh, my praise for Dr. Williams and uh, his staff and every single teacher in the school system. Uh, just coming, I this past year I got a great opportunity to work with um, the center staff and coming from the East Zone where we haven't had that much interaction 
with I haven't really had no much interaction with the central staff and a lot of misconceptions about the work the school system does and its lack of trans transparency. I think it's been really invalidated. I, I in my uh, opinion, has been really invalidated, invalidated from seeing their work. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I got to sit in a meeting with the communications team, and gee, uh, I can't really explain how professional and diligent that they really work. And Dr. Williams, it's all due to your leadership and every single staff. So I commend you all. Thank you. Mr. Offerman? Yes, I'd like to say to all stakeholders and everyone involved with this that we've heard a lot about plans, which I'm very happy and very excited about, but I also know that we need to stay very flexible because this is an ever-changing environment, and we are learning as we, uh, as we all do this. So I would uh, ask everyone to understand that, that there's a very tough learning curve with this, and hopefully we will uh, we will do better and we will uh and we'll also uh, uh, we also continue to to improve. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. Yes, um, when it, William William Winston Churchill said that we make a living by what we give, but we make a life we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give, and so from Dr. Williams, through the staff, to the school administration, to teachers, custodians, cafeteria workers, everyone who is working in this system, and parents, I have an abundance of appreciation for what you have done and what you are doing and what you will do. This has been monumental. Um, staff, the work you've done is more than the paycheck that you get. So it really is more than making a living. And the same soon will be for those in the schoolhouse. And for parents, you've stepped up. Thank you for keeping us on our toes. This virus, as dreadful as it is, is making us stronger and better and thinking out of the box. And like Mr. McMillian said, I'm excited. I'm excited about all of the possibilities that are ahead of us for what we can really do in terms of educating our children. Mr. Kuhn? Thank you, Ms. Causey. I just wanted to take a minute um, as a parent <laughs> to sit there and say that um, I realize, along with um, multiple board members, that it's a difficult time. And there's a lot of anxiety uh, with kids going back to college and our school year about to kick off. There's a lot going on in families across this our county, state, and across the nation. And I just want to make sure that um, that we're doing the best that we can uh, for for the people of Baltimore County. So <clears throat> the one thing that I do want to make sure that um, that we realize is we're all trying to deliver an education the best way we can uh, to to the public, and we need to just keep our eye on the ball and hopefully. Um, uh, the staff, administrators, all the way down, uh, all the, up and down and across the entire um, system realize that um, the key is to, to provide the best education possible with what we have at the time we have it. And like Mr. Offerman said, flexibility is very important. So we're going to work to make this the best year we can. And, um, and uh, good luck. Thank you. Dr. Hager? Uh, thank you. So I, I want to echo what everyone else has said already, that we're very grateful to the school system for the, for the wonderful plan that they put forth. Especially, I want to say again, thank you for the, for the plan for high school sports. I think you're giving a lot of student athletes a lot of hope. 
Um, and I think that this is uh, gonna be really exciting for them to hear about tomorrow morning. Um, I'm also optimistic about just generally how things are gonna go this fall. I think the plan is very well thought out. Um, but I do encourage parents and students and teachers and staff to continue providing feedback, um, including when things are going well and some things that you like about the plan and how things are going once it gets implemented. Um, and you know, saying again what others have said that this is a first for all of us. We're all in this together. Um, and I know that everyone is really invested in getting it right. So um, you know, please don't be shy and continue to write to the school board and to the rest of the, the school system to kind of keep us posted on how it's going for your, your family and your children. That's it. Thank you. For my board comments this evening, I wanted to read the uh, email that was sent as part of public comment submitted by uh, the president of TABCO, Ms. Cindy Sexton. Dr. Williams, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hand, and members of the board, educators miss their students. We miss our peers, our classrooms, our supplies. But most of all, we miss our students. We can't wait until we can greet them in person and welcome them into our physical learning environments, but we know that that can't happen with the pandemic. The pandemic. School is starting in four short weeks and will be nothing like any of us have ever done before. This is not the continuity of learning that we implemented in crisis mode in the spring. This will be authentic and rigorous. There will be expectations for attendance, engagement, and grading. Woven into it all will be educators always aware of the social emotional health and needs of their students needs that have been exacerbated by COVID-19 concerns and unknowns, and all the race and racism issues, rallies, and needs that were brought to the forefront of our communities and our nation this summer. There is so much going on in our society. Educators are here for the students. We want to help them, teach them, be there for them. Let us not forget that our educators, our families, our communities are also going through these same feelings and emotions. Let us please make sure we are leaving time and availability for the adults to reach out for social emotional support too. We ourselves must be physically, mentally, emotionally well in order to best serve our students. And we will be serving our students. Educators didn't stop teaching in the spring and will be working even harder in the fall. We know BCPS leadership, the Board of Education members, all members of the bargaining units, we all know how much effort, time, planning and work has gone into and will continue to go into our distance learning plans and implementation. We know it won't be easy. Through clear communication and collaboration, we will all work to be sure our students succeed. The challenges and opportunities are great. Let us face them together. Respectfully submitted by Cindy Sexton. And the last thing I'll say to uh, our students is to please understand that all of these people professionals, volunteers, parents are dedicated to your well-being and your success. We love you very much. And now the next uh, item on the agenda is item R, information. Attached to board docs is the revised superintendent's rule 1270, community relations, community involvement, parent and family engagement. Also is the revised superintendent's rule 5230, students promotion and retention student records. The last item on the agenda is item S, announcements. Our next board meeting is Tuesday, August 25th at 6.30 p.m. And with that, our meeting is we are closing our open session and we are going into back into a closed session.